Hello everyone. Before we begin, I need to inform you that this story is, in fact, the continuation of a monstrous narration I posted last year. If you are not caught up on the lore, please feel free to listen to part one of this epic. The link is in the description. I would also, once again, like to take a moment to thank the author and a fellow channel patron, Skiller189X, for his undying patience and commendable perfectionism for his craft, therefore bettering my creation of the final product. I know you're listening, so thank you, Skiller. Always a pleasure working with you. Thank you all for listening and supporting what I do. If it were not for your support and general interest in horror content, this video would not exist. So, thank you. And I do hope you enjoy. Now, let's delve into the dark together. Diary Entry Number 2 Manifest Destiny I opened the door of the cheap motel room and stepped out on the landing. I was mildly surprised to see our car hadn't been vandalized during the night. I was woken up at least twice before dawn by loud shouts from drunken men and the incessant laughing of equally drunk but amused women. The sound of dropped bottles breaking on the pavement was only matched by the loud slams of doors as the couples staggered back into their rooms. What I wouldn't have given to stay in a nice holiday inn, I thought. But, unfortunately, there was little choice when one is on a shoestring budget. A moment later, Steve opened the door of his adjacent room and stepped out onto the landing beside me, stretching and yawning. Jack, he said, I've seen better rooms in flop houses on Skid Row. I smiled at his reference to the infamously seedy neighborhood back home in Los Angeles. Steve? I laughed. I'm not even going to ask you how you would know that. Yeah, I think he was a regular guest of the LAPD Vice Squad. Came a gruff voice from behind us. Out stepped Tom Schmidt the burly member of our triumvirate. Fuck you, replied Steve jovially. At least I can get laid, old-timer. I had a laugh again. It was always amazing to me how these two diametrically opposed personalities have bonded into what have become a deep mutual friendship over the past year. Steve, an ardent surfer, was the very embodiment of the laid-back California beach bum. Tom, in contrast, was a no-nonsense, laser-focused, former homicide detective. Steve looked the parts with his long blonde hair and well-muscled, tanned body. Tom was Steve's antithesis, large and burly, with a keen proclivity for fast food. Well, I'm glad to see you both in such a good mood this morning, I said. What's the occasion? Who wouldn't be in a good mood? Steve replied. We'd taken out nearly, what, a dozen nests of the Mortis vampires since we started this gig? And we're on our way to destroying another. We're on a roll. Nothing makes me happier than killing every one of those blood-sucking freaks that we can find. I thought about that. Uh, true, we've done well, I told Steve. But I don't want to get complacent. The guy we're tracking now is much different than the others. Uh, I don't know, uh, more sophisticated, more calculated, and with protection. I think he's going to be far more dangerous than any we've encountered before. Yeah, growled Schmidt. About as dangerous as I'm going to be if I don't get some fucking coffee. I put my hands up. Okay, okay, you guys deserve a good breakfast after sleeping in this shithole. Let's get over to the greasy spoon over there. It's my treat. Steve rolled his eyes and shot back. Wow, big spender. And we'll be lucky not to get food poisoning. Come on, Tom. We'll get that coffee black. Just like we like our women. Schmidt shot Steve a disapproving look. But then the two of them headed off to the diner. I'll catch up with you guys. I called after them. 
Save me a seat. I need to leave a message for Simon first. As I went back into the room to use the phone, I couldn't help but reflect on how we had ended up in this rundown suburb of Atlanta. It was hard to believe it was now December 1982, and in just another week we would be celebrating Christmas. A holiday that Steve, Tom, and myself definitely had a renewed respect for. When one fights vampires, the very essence of evil, one learns very quickly the struggle between good and evil, light and dark, love and hate, truth and deceit, all of it. It's no fucking joke. It was only by having faith in God's grace that we were able to persevere. But still, good does not always triumph over evil. And that's where the Magnus clan of vampires came into play. The classic case of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Their advice, help, and, well, funding, at least makes it a more level playing field. It all began a little over a year ago, in Simi Valley, California, when the three of us had faced one of the most vile and evil vampires of them all, Alexandria. She entered our lives out of the blue, unsolicited, and ended up killing our best friends, Mike and Dale, and Mike's parents, Larry and Ida, Dale's girlfriend, Kate, and at least a dozen others that we're aware of. Steve and I, college students and friends since we were kids, were later joined by Tom Schmidt, an asshole Simi Valley homicide detective in a quest to kill Alexandria and rid the world of her evil presence. We were aided by the technical knowledge of my girlfriend, Bethany, herself a college student at USC and who had ostensibly studied vampirism in Europe. Mike, Dale, and Kate had been turned by Alexandria, and we were forced to kill them by decapitation. Bethany had provided a blessed and sanctified silver knife that was used for vampire executions. Finally, we tracked Alexandria down in her lair below a long-abandoned train tunnel near the Santa Susana Pass. However, Steve and I fell into a trap that she had set for us, and would have surely been killed if it was not for Bethany coming to our rescue. She sacrificed herself by pulling Alexandria into a bottomless cavern along with her. It was only later that I learned that Bethany, the love of my life, was also a vampire a member of the Vampire Magnus clan, which had learned to live alongside humanity in peace and coexistence. Bethany's mission was to hunt down and kill Alexandria and other members of her opposing clan called the Vampire Mortis, which believed humanity only existed for their depraved pleasures. In a note Bethany had left me, she explained that her clan in the past had recruited humans as vampire hunters to help in their cause, and she believed I had the inherent qualities necessary to fight and defeat Mortis, qualities of goodness and loyalty. I had never considered myself to be an overly pious man. If anything, I think I have become more hardened after losing Bethany. If you were forced to cut off your best friend's head you'd probably be a different person as well. Such things can't help but to change a person. But whatever I have now become, it was Bethany's last wish, and I had to honor that. I decided to make it my life's mission to hunt down the Mortis and destroy them. For his part, Steve felt the same. He had lost his two closest friends as well, and after reading Bethany's letter, he vowed to support me in my quest to eradicate the Mortis. Schmidt didn't hesitate either. He had seen Alexandria in her natural form as a hideous bat creature. He saw true evil that night, and he knew he could never go back to his normal life like nothing happened. He took early retirement from the police department and took on the role of researching unexplained disappearances and murders around the country, providing leads to the possible existence of Mortis Enclaves. Steve and I, well... We dropped off the grid, too. No choice but to drop out of college. Uh, we spent probably eight months of that first year on the road, in California and eight other states, in search for the Mortis. 
Of course, it would have been near impossible for two broke college kids and a retired cop to afford the travel and lodging necessary to go trekking around the country. What events made that possible came out of left field and changed the trajectory of our mission. It was about a week after Bethany's death. Steve and Tom had finally left me alone in my North Hollywood apartment to go back to their own homes to take care of business and get their affairs in order. There was a knock on the front door around ten in the evening. I opened it and saw a young man standing on the stoop. He looked to be only a few years older than me, maybe in his late twenties. He had lean, chiseled features with a smooth complexion, a rather soft yet handsome face overall, with shoulder-length, semi-curly, dark brown hair. He wore very nice slacks, collar shirt, and a corduroy sports coat with patches on the elbows. Together, with his wire-framed glasses, he looked very much like one of my college professors. Hello, Mr. Walker. I'm so glad to meet you. My name is Simon. He introduced himself. He skipped a beat, then continued. There was a matter I need to discuss with you. A matter of mutual interest. Are you free to talk? I gave him another once-over. Uh, what do you want to talk about? I asked him. Oh, that's probably something best discussed inside. If you would be so kind as to invite me in, I'll tell you all about it. Suddenly, alarm bells started going off in my head. That ominous request. Could it be? I had flashbacks to when my friend Dale was at the very same door, unable to cross the threshold until he was invited in. After he was turned into a vampire by Alexandria. I stared at Simon. I noticed his eyes were a brilliant blue. They reminded me of the distinctive eyes of a Siamese cat. You'll forgive me, I said, but I recently had a very bad experience when inviting a person into my home. Once he was inside, he completely forgot his manners. You could say he really lost his head. I looked at Simon for a reaction. He simply smiled. Mr. Walker, he said. I assure you I am a man of etiquette. I abhor any lack of manners, especially in one's home. But I understand your reluctance. With that, he turned slightly around and lifted up his hair. There, on his neck, behind and below his ear, was a tattoo of a cat's head, or more in the likeness of a bobcat with very long ears. I guess the thing about his eyes weren't that far from the truth, but more significantly, the cat's head was superimposed over crossed daggers. It was the mark. The mark of the vampire Magnus. Just as Bethany had foretold in her last note to me. She said I would be visited by a representative from her clan, and here he was. Please, uh, come in, I told Simon. But take off your shoes. This is a no-shoe house. Simon crossed the threshold and followed me into the family room. I indicated for him to sit down. Uh, something to drink? I offered. Uh, how about a cold beer? I'm fine, thanks, he replied. I gave him an appraising look. Yeah, I suppose not. Uh, maybe something a little warmer? Uh, something red? Maybe some blood from the neighbor's cat? Simon just gave me a wry smile and said, No need to be obtuse, Jack. Is your animosity towards me because of Bethany? Do you blame us for her death? I lost it then. A week of pent-up anger and grief boiled over. I stood up so quickly I knocked over my chair. You're fucking right, I blame you. I unleashed. Or your kind, or your clan. You were all looking for Alexandria, the baddest of the bad, the queen of evil. So why was Bethany left here all alone? Why weren't more of you here to help her? She died because of you. I choked on my last words and looked down on the floor with eyes full of tears, muttered. She died because of me. She sacrificed herself for me, and I couldn't save her. I pulled up the chair and sat down. This time the look Simon gave me was one of sadness, or remorse. I wasn't sure. 
We're very sorry about what happens to Bethany, Jack, he said. You probably think our kind is unfeeling, incapable of emotions. We are the undead, after all, right? But you knew Bethany better than anybody. Wasn't she capable of warmth, humor, and laughter, but also sadness, worry, and grief? She knew friendship, and above all else, love. Like any normal human being. We do have feelings, Jack. Bethany was a member of our family. Her death was felt deeply by all of us. As for me, I knew her for, well, shall we say, quite a number of years. I nodded, feeling embarrassed, selfish. I had only been thinking of myself. Of course, I wasn't the only one that knew Bethany. Or had her in their lives. For all I knew, Simon may have known her for hundreds of years... In comparison, my time with her was minuscule. As if reading my mind, Simon waited until I looked up so he could look directly in my eyes. Then he said, One thing I know above all else, Jack, is that Bethany's love for you was real. And it was strong. What she did, she did it because she loved you. From scripture, Jack... Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. I nodded, wiping away another tear. We sat in silence for a moment. Then Simon continued. I'll be honest with you, Jack. You were right about us failing Bethany. Me, specifically. She had relayed to us that Alexandria was here in Los Angeles, of course... I was selected to come, but at the time, I was dealing with a rather nasty situation in Chicago. A member of the Mortis, who embraced pedophilia for his personal gratification, had killed at least twelve children. He was a true monster. As far as we knew, he kidnapped and assaulted eight boys and four girls, all under the age of ten, over a period of several years. As you can imagine... Missing children, above all else, does not go unnoticed. So this guy was really drawing attention to himself, and to our kind. Very soon, the pieces would have been connected, and it would have been national news. So, even though Alexandria had priority, I stayed to finish the job. I should have just left immediately, and I could have been here before you went into the cave. So, you see, Jack... I have my own regrets, and it'll be my own cross to bear. Simon waited a few moments, then leaned closer to me. Jack, Bethany recognized the qualities in you to help us fight the Vampire Mortis. She told us of your inner good, your capacity to fight for what's moral and righteous. We want your help. Bethany was, as I am, a member of the Vampire Magnus or the main, original, vampire bloodline. Contrary to popular belief and the Hollywood movies, vampires are not all evil. We are simply a different species. Yes, we have to drink blood to survive, as any animal must kill to eat their prey, but we learned centuries ago to satisfy this need, but by not killing humans, whom we are dedicated to living amongst in peace and harmony. Do you know that there are actually several successful and influential people contributing to your society that are Vampire Magnus? They hide their true identity as well, and camouflage their lifestyle so they are never seen in the public during the day. Often, they create personas as eccentrics, where it can be acceptable for them to only be out during the hours of the night. They are productive members of your society, Jack. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects. The list can go on. So, what about you? I asked Simon. What's your role in society? He smiled and replied. I've had myriad careers over the years, he replied. Too many to mention. But at the current time, I'm known as a rather good private detective operating in Las Vegas. Listen, Jack, 
This is the bottom line. You and the human race have nothing to fear from the Vampire Magnus. Our common enemy is the Vampire Mortis. You have seen their evil firsthand, and Bethany dedicated her life to fight them. She chose you to help us. She had faith in you. I'm here now to ask you to join us. Throughout history, there have been other humans who have done so. You have access that we do not. For what you can do in the world of the daylight, for one. If you decide to join us, I'm volunteering to be your intermediary to the Magnus. Your case officer, if you will. Together, we'll attack the Mortis from every angle, just as Bethany would have wanted. We'll supply you with the best intelligence we have on the enemy, and provide a stipend to cover expenses. But, if you don't have confidence in me, because of what happens to Bethany, I'll step aside and let the Magnus leader assign someone else. But I'm here to tell you that I will never let you down from this point on. And Jack, there is a lot of work to do. As I speak, there are Mortis members feeding on the homeless all around the country. At least five or six Mortis that we know of have a nest in San Francisco. Vagrants have been disappearing at an alarming amount around the Tenderloin district. This has got to be our next focus, and there's no time to waste. What do you say, Jack? I had to admire Simon's pitch. It was nicely done. He didn't realize, however, that I had already decided to devote my life to fight the Mortis the minute I finished reading Bethany's letter. It had been a foregone conclusion, and whether or not I accepted the offer to join forces with the Vampire Magnus wouldn't change that. But obviously... It was also Bethany's desire that I linked up with her own people. And what would be the point in denying their offer? Simon was right. The Vampire Magnus knew more about the Mortis clan than I ever could. They had the knowledge of the enemy built over millennia. I needed that knowledge. And I needed their ability to scout out the Mortis enclaves. It would make for an odd marriage, but it was the only logical thing to do. I extended my hand and waited for Simon to grasp it. Okay, I said. What's next? Now, a year later, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. A week after that handshake with Simon, Steve, Tom, and I were in San Francisco on our first mission. Tom, through his police contacts, determines that the number of Mortis victims were at least thirteen, and those were the ones that they found. There were likely more that went undiscovered. The victims consisted of seven women, five men, and one fourteen-year-old boy. With the help of intelligence provided by the Magnus, we learned of several sites around the Tenderloin area that were likely enclaves of the rogue Mortis vampires. Most of them were derelict buildings, but we also had to scout out several underground drainage systems in the area. That was the hard part. One by one, we checked out the sites during the day, looking for any presence of Nosferatu. After five days, we still hadn't had any luck. We were beginning to wonder if the enclave lay further out of the district. Then I got an update from Simon. We had a sighting of one of the mortis in the tenderloin last night. He spent the night at various nightclubs, at no killing, but he was tracked back to the area around Lake Merced. That's about six miles in a direct line from the Tenderloin. Seems they were smart, didn't want to hold up in their killing ground. We now think their nest is in one of the long-forgotten underground pumping stations of the abandoned Fleshhacker Pool. I thought about what Simon just said. You mean, they're underneath some swimming pool? I asked, incredulously. Not just an ordinary pool, Jack, Simon explained. The Fleshacker Pool was built in 1924 and was one of a kind. More than six million gallons of chilly salt water were brought in from the nearby Pacific Ocean and heated to a tolerable 65 to 75 degrees. With a 10,000 swimmer capacity, the pool measured 1,000 feet by 150 feet and was so massive it required lifeguards to use rowboats for their patrols. 
In addition to its popularity among area residents, the pool was also regularly used for military drills and exercises. Over the years, the funds required to maintain the enormous facility began to wither, and the pool was already in a state of decline when a storm destroyed a drainage pipe in 1971. The city shuttered it for good later that year. For the past eleven years, the pool had been left derelict. There are sightseers to the above-ground ruins of the old pool house, but the underground pump stations and series of huge pipes extended out into the ocean have been totally abandoned. Twenty-four-hour darkness, with no chance of being disturbed. The perfect place for the mortars to establish their nest. Rest there by day, then travel to their killing grounds at night. That is where you'll find them, Jack. And that's exactly what we did. First, Steve visited the municipal archives in San Francisco to get a copy of the schematics of the Flesh Hacker pool, specifically the engineering diagrams of the pumping system underneath the pool. We discovered there were three pumping stations a story underground connected to a large array of pipelines. These pumping stations were responsible for pumping in the massive amounts of ocean water, heating it to the desired temperature, and then pumping the warm salt water into the pool. Conversely, there was a series of pumps that would send the used water back into the ocean at low tide. Steve, Tom, and I went the following day, armed with our newly updated array of vampire-killing implements. It took us a bit of doing to get to the neglected and rusted metal door leading to the underground system without being seen. The abandoned pool and pool house still attracted the curious and the urban explorers. Tom cut the lock, and we went in. There was a set of metal spiral stairs leading down. As we already knew, there was no power, so we turned on our headlamps. We made our way through one pump station, but didn't see anything, other than forgotten items from decades past. The large pumps were rusted due to the underground humidity, and with their massive intake and outtake pipes snaking out in all directions, they resembled a predatory octopus. Fucking creepy, Tom muttered. Yeah, agreed Steve. Why do these bloodsuckers always find the most godforsaken places to hide in? The more isolated, the safer they rest in the daytime, I replied. We're going to be in real trouble if they're actually hiding in this pipe system. It'd take days to crawl through all these, and many of them still lead out into the ocean. Tom looked at me incredulously. No fucking way I'm ever going to go into one of those pipes. Uh-uh, no way. Steve chuckled. Some tough homicide cop, afraid of the dark. But even his voice had a trace of nervousness. Hopefully it won't come to that, I told them. After clearing the first pump station, we followed a corridor that led to the next. As we entered into the room, Steve grabbed my arm and pointed. There, lying on the floor on the far side of the room, were six bodies. Four men and two women. Two of the men were dressed very casually, in jeans and t-shirts. The other two looked higher-end with slacks and sports coats. One of the women was in shorts and a halter top. The other was in a nice, one-piece dress. Three were white, two were black, and one looked to be Asian. A very diverse group, I thought. One thing they had in common, though, was that they weren't dead. Their complexions were full and healthy, even a bit rosy. The mouths of some of them actually curved up in the beginning of a smile. Do vampires dream? I thought to myself. If they do, whatever they were dreaming couldn't be good. I'd seen enough. I gave the hand signal to Tom to bring up his high-powered water cannon. He had upgraded from the less powerful water rifle he had used during our last go-around. This cannon was fed under pressure from a five-gallon tank strapped on to Tom's back. It had been filled with blessed and sanctified holy water. He took a few steps forward, and then pulled the trigger. The water shot out in a powerful stream. Tom worked from left to right, then back from right to left, saturating all the bodies within seconds. Suddenly, the near silence of the room was filled with the most horrific screams. 
The vampires were caught by surprise, but as they tried to sit up, their skin was already beginning to slough off. One of the women glared at me in pure hate, but within seconds her eyes liquefied and poured down her cheeks. As their muscles and tendons smoked and sizzled, their mouths began an eerie litany of clicking and gnashing, displaying their large, sharp incisors. Was that an involuntary reaction, I wonder? Or were they, even now, still trying to attack us? No matter. Within a few more seconds, their screams began to dissipate as their vocal cords dissolved. Soon they were little more than skeletons with a few strips of flesh hanging off, their innards now spilling out onto the dirty floor. All right, said Steve, looking in me. Who's got the honors, you or me? I pulled out Bethany's sacred knife. Per the Vampire Magnus ritual, we needed it to give the coup de grace to the vampire. The holy water incapacitated the vampire, but would not destroy it. It could regenerate over time. We had to finish them off with the sacred ritual. I looked at Bethany's knife. Its blade was about seven or eight inches long. One side was razor sharp and curled up to a very nasty pointed tip, while the other had a wicked looking serrated edge. It looked a lot like a Marine Corps K-bar knife. This knife had a bright silver blade, and the handle was made from ivory. Etched into the blade was the Latin inscription, Deus Lux Mea Est, meaning God is my light. The knife was more than 500 years old, originally used by an esoteric wing of the Catholic Church dedicated to hunting down and killing vampires, lost to time and generations, eventually obtained by the vampire Magnus as they sought to eradicate their evil offshoot. I'll do it, I told Steve. For Bethany. I suspect you'll have many more chances to do it in the future. Steve squeezed my shoulder in silent acknowledgement. I walked forward, and then, one by one, performed the gruesome task. First, I washed the blade in fresh holy water. Then, I plunged the blade through what was left of the monster's heart. Then, in the last act, I took the knife and decapitated the vampire. As I did so, I incited the holy words, Ajure te, Spiritus Nequiesme, Per Diem Omnipotentem. Latin for, I adjure thee, most evil spirit, by Almighty God. A few minutes later, it was done. All six of the vampires were firmly dispatched. I ardently wished that their souls were released to make their way to a better place. We then started to make our way towards the third pump station. After the primal screams of the vampires we killed, I had doubts whether we'd find any more of them, certainly not lying peacefully at sleep. True enough, as we entered the third chamber, two more vampires, a man and a woman, were trying to hide behind some of the equipment, hissing and snarling. Apparently, we had blocked their avenue of escape, and now we had their backs to the wall, literally. With Tom's water cannon at the ready, we slowly encircled the two. Then, strangely, the man suddenly smiled, revealing rows of needle-like teeth dripping saliva. Vampire hunter... He hissed in an ominous tone. We heard you were searching for us. You can kill all of us here, but you'll never get all of us. We're too powerful. We are everywhere. We are Legion. Then, as his face morphed so that its smile literally went ear to ear, he made an ominous threat that chilled my blood. Eventually... The tables will turn, Vampire Hunter. The day will come when we come looking for you. Schmidt had enough. Fuck you, you piece of shit. We're gonna track every one of your kind down and baptize your asses. A real come to Jesus moment, beginning now. With that, Schmidt shot a stream of holy water right into Big Mouth's face. 
That sure took his smirk off. As he staggered backwards, the vampire helplessly clawed at his face as his eyes literally popped out, hanging down his cheeks by their optical nerves. The woman then made a move to lunge at Steve, but Schmidt gave her a blast of water that created a melting, gaping hole in her chest. They were both down for the count. I gave Steve the knife, and he finished them off. We walked out of the chamber. We took another sweep, but there was a feeling in the air. We were alone, with the nest cleared and eight skulls to our credit. We were done. That was our first mission. After that, with Vampir Magnus intel and our own research, we identified and destroyed large mortis enclaves in Seattle, Las Vegas, and Dallas. In contrast, one of our more challenging cases was locating and destroying a Magnus vampire nest that was very isolated, hiding in a long-abandoned copper mine near Bisbee, Arizona. They had been feeding in a nearby military town called Sierra Vista, but on a few occasions as far away as Tucson. In other cases, we scouted out the singletons, those that hunted and fed on their own. In many cases, these were the tough ones, but not being in a group, they tended to leave virtually little to no sign of their whereabouts, and thus were difficult to track down. Often they tended to hide themselves in small, rural towns, staking out their own killing grounds. It took many months, but we ended up finding those rogue vampires in small towns like Marion, Alabama, Wellston, Michigan, and Parrotsville, Tennessee. All in all, we had over ten missions over that long year. All this went through my memory in a flash as I entered my motel room. I was due to call Simon and arrange for a strategy session concerning our current target. His name was Kim Song Ho. As the name implied, he was Korean. Our background check revealed he was born in Atlanta to Korean immigrants nearly 50 years ago. Yet Kim didn't look a day over 30. We already recognized the guy was going to be one of the toughest cases yet. He was an anomaly to the usual mortis vampire we had fought in the past. There were two major differences. Number one, by day he didn't hunker down in the city's forgotten underground labyrinth or other abandoned and derelict locations. Rather, he rested comfortably inside his two million dollar home in a gated community within the Duluth suburb of Atlanta. Ostensibly, Kim ran a legitimate import business distributing food, grocery, and consumer products to the hundreds of Asian stores and restaurants within the very large Korean communities of Atlanta. It was a very large and lucrative market since there were over 20,000 Koreans in Atlanta, most of them concentrated in Gwinnett County. Kim even received several awards from his local Chamber of Commerce and from the mayor of Atlanta. Unlike the usual Mortis vampire, Kim didn't live off the grid. He lived in it. He successfully integrated himself into society and was a productive member of his community. To his friends and neighbors, Kim was a friendly, kind, and generous man. In many respects, he was a lot like the Magnus vampire. But there was one frightening difference. By night, Kim hunted human prey. And he had help. The second difference between him and the other Mortis vampires was that he kept familiars in his circle. Just as in the movies, familiars were humans that pledged complete loyalty to their vampire masters, and many of them do so with the hope that they will eventually be turned into a vampire themselves as a reward. The bond between master and familiar is made formal when they are fed a fresh drop of the vampire's blood. From that moment, the familiar becomes addicted to the blood of their master and will obey without question. They perform tasks that will safeguard and protect their vampire benefactor, such as covering up sunlight in their homes, helping them travel to distant places, finding other humans as prey, and hiding the evidence of their kills. Familiars are usually quite fanatical, highly devoted, and very, very dangerous. The information I received indicated Kim had at least five familiars, probably more, all Korean. His right-hand man and main protector, 
Ahn Pyong So served ostensibly as Kim's business partner. He ran all facets of the business during the daytime and attended most of the company's public events. The second most important familiar was a woman, Lee Min Young. Lee served as Kim's secretary, scheduler, and personal assistant. Number three in the hierarchy was Shin Song Hee, Kim's personal bodyguard. Shin was usually the one in Kim's closest proximity at any given time. Working with Lee were two other security goons, Park Myung-guk and Han Tae-won. According to the Magnus report, all three of the security men, Shin, Park, and Han, were highly trained in the Korean martial art of Taekwondo, as well as the very lethal Muay Thai, Filipino Eskrima, Japanese Ninjutsu, and Israeli Krav Maga. To get to Kim Song-ho, we would have to go through these people first, and it wasn't going to be easy. Our intelligence from the Magnus indicated that Kim had been using Atlanta as his killing grounds for decades. As with human serial killers, he attempted to draw the least attention to himself by targeting prostitutes, runaways, the homeless, and other dregs of society that wouldn't easily be missed. And he did one thing that was extremely ingenious— during the past three years, many of his victims were boys and young men. Kim knew that most of the disappearances would be blamed on the serial killer that had been terrorizing Atlanta since the late 1970s. During what became known as the Atlanta Child Murders, more than 100 agents were working on the investigation. The city of Atlanta imposed curfews, and parents in the city removed their children from school and forbade them from playing outside. By the time Wayne Williams was arrested in May of 1981, at least 28 children and young men had been murdered. The 23-year-old Williams was tried and convicted of two of the adult murders and sentenced to two consecutive life terms. Police subsequently attributed a number of the child murders to Williams, although he was never charged with them, and he has always maintained his innocence. The city of Atlanta eager to put the crisis behind it, pointed out the killings ceased after William's arrest. So, the question begs, did the police get their man, or did the real killer just change his M.O.? I'll give you one guess. I picked up the room phone and dialed the cutout number I had for Simon. Genovese Oil and Gas, Sharon speaking. How can I help you? Came the voice of the receptionist. Sharon was a Magnus familiar, performing her role answering phones for what was in actuality a front company. She was my intermediary to Simon and the Magnus leadership. I sometimes referred to her as Miss Moneypenny because she spoke with the most perfect Queen's English. Hello, Sharon. I replied in greeting. This is John Storm. I identified myself in my assigned pseudonym. My true identity, along with those of Steve and Tom, were known only to the top echelons of the Magnus Vampire Clan. I'd like to discuss an invoice order with Simon when he gets a chance. Sure thing, replied Sharon cheerfully. What is the invoice number? I gave her the number, which was actually the telephone number of the motel, followed by the room number. This was our system for providing Simon my contact number whenever we rolled into a new town. A bit cloak and dagger, but remember, this was 1982, long before the age of throwaway cell phones. Sharon manned the phones by day, and, of course, Simon would return my call later that evening, once the sun had set. Got it, Mr. Storm. Sharon acknowledged. I'll pass it along. Hope you and your friends are doing well. Stay safe out there. I liked Sharon, although I had never met her. She was always very pleasant. I can never understand how one could serve vampire masters in the hopes of becoming one themselves. Maybe for immortality? Uh, for power? I couldn't judge the morality of the reasons why. All I knew was that it wasn't for me, and I'd be very happy to grow old under my own terms. Thanks, Sharon. You too. I walked over to the diner to join Steve and Tom. I spotted them in a booth in the back corner. I wasn't surprised to find that Steve had ordered his usual breakfast salad, a hard-boiled egg, and a glass of V8 juice. Tom, of course, was having his usual plates of over-easy eggs, bacon, ham, hash browns, and a side of toast. He looked to already be on his second pitcher of coffee. 
Does it meet your expectations? I asked, taking a seat and grabbing a menu. It's passable, Steve provided. And as you can see, Tom's working hard on that future triple bypass surgery. Yeah, fuck you. Tom smiled between swallows. Real men eat real food. You should try it sometime. I laughed, and then said, Sorry, Steve. I'm gonna side with Tom on this one. Flagging down the waitress, I winked at Steve. I'm gonna go with that delicious-looking hamburger, steak, and eggs. We spent the rest of the day conducting a discreet reconnaissance of Kim's home and places of business. We knew that by day we would find Kim at his home in Duluth, and daytime, of course, would be our preferred time to take him out. Getting into his gated community wouldn't be the main obstacle. As with all so-called gated communities, most of the security is at the main entrance only. The guard or keypad at the gate mainly prevents unauthorized vehicular traffic from entering. The gate is there mostly for aesthetics. The actual perimeter consisting of metal fencing or low stone walls can be easily breached. In truth, most people don't realize that gated communities are actually a target for thieves. Those big iron gates make the statement, this community has money. And people with money go out more often and take more vacations, leaving their homes vulnerable. Especially if the owner has no home security alarm because of the false sense of security and illusion that the front gate stops any and all thieves. Kim's home may have had an alarm system, but Tom knew how he would be able to disable it. No, our main challenge would be Kim's daytime bodyguards, his familiars. They would not be wounded or disabled by our holy water, bibles, and crucifixes. They would die defending their master. We would have to kill them. By bullets or other. I had the discussion with Steve and Tom. We've never had to kill humans before, since we've never encountered familiars before. This is much different than killing one of the undead. Do either of you have moral qualms with that, especially if it's a woman? I asked. Technically, it's murder, said Tom, wearing his cop hat. They are still living persons, and murder is not only against the law, it's a sin. I don't think God would condemn us for killing him, Steve replied. By being facilitators for the mortis and luring other people to their death, surely their souls are already damned in the eyes of God. Look, I agree, replied Tom. I'm just being the devil's advocate. If we get caught for any reason, we'll have a hell of a time explaining the dead bodies. Well, I said, I guess we just make sure not to be caught. Are we all in? Steve looked at Tom, eyebrows raised. Tom looked at me, smiling, and replied, All the way. We started with Kim's house. We had no problem entering the community, but there were several areas of low stone walls and plenty of trees on both sides to provide concealment, so basically, we just walked in. Conveniently, Kim's house wasn't far from the perimeter. There was just a golf course green separating the fence area and the back of his place. Once inside, we separated, since a group of three men would likely draw the attention of residents or any roaming security. For the next hour, we made notes of the access and egress to the home. Without getting too close, we looked for any possible security cameras or other intruder detection systems. We saw none. Other than normal residential vehicular traffic, we didn't see any roving security patrols. The gate guards worked eight-hour shifts and didn't appear to ever leave their posts. All in all, the security in the community seemed light. Tom had earlier secured floor plans of the house, so he knew the interior layout. We knew from the schematics there was the front's main entrance, one rear main entrance, and another rear entrance from a sunroom. There was a three-car garage, which could also offer a means of exit. Most challenging was, there were several bedrooms upstairs and in the basement, providing several places Kim could be resting. But we were fairly confident that Kim's lair would be in the basement, since it would provide the best protection from the sun's rays. In the past, we encountered Mortis vampires that took extraordinary measures to ensure they were shrouded from the sun's rays. 
It's a misnomer that it's the ultraviolet rays from the sun that is lethal to vampires. It has nothing to do with the science. The sun is divine, created by God. As such, its rays will burn the flesh of the undead. In scriptures, there is a passage in which God states, Fear my living flame, and it will bite deep and savor your flesh. After finishing with the house, we next checked out Kim's main office and distribution hub. It was located about 15 miles away, not far from Stone Mountain. It covered several acres with multiple loading docks. It had a lot of activity, and not surprising since Kim reportedly had nearly 500 employees. We again cased the facility as best we could while remaining discreet. It was highly unlikely we would resort to encountering Kim at his place of work, but all contingencies had to be considered. The main obstacle is that the facility had a night shift, and there would be way too many employees and witnesses to deal with. Also, we noted a few security cameras, one at the main entrance, and a few more covering the rear loading docks. Tom was confident we could disable the cameras if we needed to, but I didn't like it. By late afternoon, we also had cased two similar distribution hubs in downtown Atlanta that were used by Kim Enterprises. We again made note of the employees, incoming and outgoing vehicle traffic, and any cameras and security measures that could be observed. By late afternoon, we felt we accomplished all we could do for the day. On the way back to the motel, we stopped by a local gas station to get the car topped off so it would be ready to go the next morning. Tom got out from behind the wheel and walked over to the pump. Steve and I left the car to stand and stretch. Can you guys believe this? Tom grumbled, and he took out the nozzle. The fucking gas is 131 here. It was just 121 out in L.A. Unbelievable. Blame the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds. Steve began to lecture. Oh great, I thought. Here we go. Apart from being an avid reader of the occult and unsolved mysteries and disappearances, Steve was an avid conspiratologist, seemingly finding dark and insidious conspiracies behind almost every corner. Tom was used to it by now, and usually gave Steve a patient ear during his tirades. It's well known that they control the world finances through the Federal Reserve Bank, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund and their activities are all planned and coordinated through the Trilateral Commission, which David Rockefeller himself founded in 1973. And the commission itself is no more than a front for the Council of Foreign Relations, another nefarious organization made up of powerful private citizens of different countries. And this is because over 90% of Trilateral Commission members are also members of the Council of Foreign Relations. This secret cabal controls all aspects of American life and manipulates our economy and energy resources. As Council of Foreign Relations member Henry Kissinger once said, Control the oil, and you can control entire continents. Control food, and you control people. It's all part of their plan for total international domination and manipulation, dude. Steve was on a roll by the time Tom had finished pumping. As we climbed back into the car, he continued on. What we have to do to get out from under the thumb of the Rockefellers and Big Oil is to go electric. You know, battery-powered cars. I laughed and then playfully slugged my best friend in the arm. That's what I like about you, Steve. Always the idealist. Yeah, Tom snickered mockingly from the front seat. Electric cars. That'll be the day. We got back to the motel and decided to chill a bit until Simon returns my call. Steve and Tom came out to my room, the former carrying his guitar case. Steve and I took our guitars when on the road, and when we could, we'd jam out like in the old days, back in the happier times when Mike, Dale, and Kate would be by our side, singing and laughing. In some ways, it made me sad, but mostly it was cathartic for both Steve and I. We felt we were doing something to honor them, and to keep the memory of them in our hearts. Tom, for his part, had not a single musical bone in his body, but during these sessions he'd sit alongside us, quietly enjoying the music while nursing his favorite drink, a glass of Jack, neat. 
It was one of those earliest road trips together that I learned a new side of Tom Schmidt. One evening, Steve pulled out a joint during one of our jams and lit up. I nearly choked on the beer I was drinking, and I studied Tom's expression as Steve smiled and held out the joint for him. For a few moments, Tom glared at Steve with a hawk-like expression, and I was sure the old cop was going to confiscate the joints and give Steve a stern lecture. To my amazement, Tom took the reefer and took a long hit. He tilted his head back and exhaled, blowing a virtual mushroom cloud of smoke into the air. When he pivoted his head to me, he quickly took stock of the shocked look on my face. Don't give me that look, Jack, he said. There's something about fighting vampires and staring pure evil in the face that does something to change one's priorities in life. He sighed. I'm not the same man I was a year ago. Tom took another hit and went on. You know, I was in my 20s back in the 1960s. A great time to be young. The era of the hippie counterculture, with the mantra of peace, drugs, and free love. Did my share of partying back then, especially at the rock concerts. One of the best was when I saw The Doors at the Hollywood Bowl in 68. My jaw literally dropped to the floor. You... you saw uh, Jim Morrison? I stammered. In concert. For real. I couldn't believe Tom had actually seen my idol in the flesh. I had been only barely ten when the Lizard King had died in Paris. I was too young to have ever seen him in concert. Oh yeah, man. Tom said, clearly feeling the effect of the smoke. And it was wild. Jim put on a hell of a show. You know, the very first time I saw the Doors perform was at the Whiskey A Go Go nightclub on the Sunset Strip in, uh, I think, 1966. I remember they were late starting their second set because Jim was missing. They went looking for him and found him in room 203 of the Tropicana Hotel. Uh, Jim had dropped acid and was wearing only underwear and a pair of boots. The guys quickly got him dressed and drug him back to the whiskey for the set. The last song they performed was The End, and Jim improvised his Oedipal lyrics about his mother and father into the song for the first time. It was fucking wild, man. I continued staring at Tom in awe as he passed the joint to me. The man had literally been present during a part of rock and roll history, and I never had a clue. I was near speechless. I finally managed to reply. Uh, you and I need to talk. Tom chuckled. Sure thing. Plenty more stories where that came from. The 60s were great times. No shit, chimed in Steve. It was the golden age of the surf culture in Southern California. Tom told me all his stories of surfing with George Greeno. Dude, you were living history all over the place. So how'd you become a cop anyway? It sure seems like a radical change in trajectory. The nostalgic smile left Tom's face, and he grew serious. You are so right, he replied. There was a long pause, then Tom spoke again, haltingly, and with emotion. My father was an LAPD homicide detective. He began. I remember his stories growing up. I remember him working the 1947 murder of the mobster Bugsy Siegel shot in his girlfriend's home in Beverly Hills. A 30 caliber slug blew out Siegel's eye 15 feet from his body while he was sitting on a couch reading a newspaper. And the killer got away with it. But the one that really haunted my father was the murder that same year of Elizabeth Short, known forever as the Black Dahlia. That crime scene haunted him to his dying day. When my father arrived to that vacant lot in the Limewood Park area of L.A., he found a living nightmare. Elizabeth's naked and mutilated body would have made Jack the Ripper proud. She was completely bisected, cut clean in half. The lower half of her body was positioned a foot away from the upper, and her intestines had been tucked neatly beneath her buttocks. The corpse had been posed with her hands over her head her elbows bent at right angles, and her legs spread apart. Entire portions of flesh had been cut away, 
and her face had been slashed from the corners of her mouth to her ears, creating the horrific effect known as the Glasgow Smile. The Black Dahlia case was the largest of that era. A total of 750 investigators from the LAPD and other departments worked on the case, which produced over 150 suspects. Yet, in the end, there were no arrests, and the case went cold. My father hated the fact he couldn't find justice for Elizabeth Short. She was just an innocent 22-year-old girl looking to start a new life in the City of Angels. He worked the case on the side, on his own time, until the day he died. Until the day he was murdered. Murdered? I asked, shocked. Your dad was murdered? Tom looked at Steve and I. You asked why I became a cop, he said. It's rather ironic, I suppose. My father, who dedicated his life to putting killers in prison, had just returned home at the end of his shift when someone walked up behind him in the driveway and shot him in the back of the head, execution style. And where was I? Partying with friends down at the beach. Dad was always upset with my lackadaisical lifestyle, but he was patient, and he figured I'd come around once I sowed my wild oats. Well, it took his murder to give me a hard kick in the ass. There was no way in hell I was going to let him die in vain. I had squandered so many years, but I vowed right then and there I could still honor my father's legacy by continuing his lifelong pursuit of justice for the victims. So I joined the LAPD in late 68 and then transferred over to the Simi Valley PD right after its formation in 1971. Although back then it had the horrendous name of the Simi Valley Community Safety Agency. The plus side was that there were no detectives. Instead, officers investigated their own cases. When the investigative division was set up, I was able to stay on as a detective, first in vice, then finally homicide. The rest was, as we say, history. Steve cleared his throat. Did they, uh, find out who killed your father? He asked. No. Tom said. They didn't. It's still an open and unsolved case, just like with the Black Dahlia. Before I retired, I made a copy of the LAPD's murder book. Don't for a New York minute think I'm not on top of it. Steve and I exchanged glances. We were both probably thinking the same thing. Tom was a defender of law and order, but if he ever got a lead on his father's killer... It was a sure thing he'd never lived to see the inside of a courtroom. That evening, as we passed the joint around, I learned a lot more about Tom Schmidt. I knew that if Mike and Dale were still alive, they would have enjoyed listening to his stories, and would no doubt consider him as a good friend as I grew to think of him. Now, in Atlanta, it was just the three of us digging to the music. After a half hour of jamming, Steve and I set our guitars down to take a break. Steve went to a small convenience store next to the motel and came back with some beer. Sorry, Jack. Apparently they didn't have Henry Weinhards out here on the East Coast. Got some of this new Budweiser beer. It just came out. Uh, they call it Bud Light. What's that supposed to mean? I asked. Well, replied Steve. It's apparently light on calories, which means a bit less alcohol also. I took a can and said sarcastically, Beer with less alcohol, then what good is it? I pulled the ring tab off and took a swig. Christ, it tastes like crap, I lamented. This is the best you could get? Sorry, man, apologized Steve, looking sheepish. Los Angeles, this place ain't. We all down south here, he said in a rather bad southern drawl. I sighed. No worries, bro. I'm glad I got my peppermint schnapps to chase it. This Bud Light stuff tastes like water. I'm sure it'll never catch on. We started to resume the jam session, but about an hour after sunset, the phone rang. 
I picked it up. Uh, hello, Simon? I answered. No, Mr. Walker, said a raspy voice, sounding like dead leaves blowing on the sidewalk in a fall wind. Not Simon. There was a small chuckle. Then... I believe you are looking for me, Mr. Walker. I would advise against it. Your reputation precedes you. You have been, how should I say, quite successful in your line of work. But those were them, and this is me. A different breed entirely. Another chuckle. Uh-huh, I interjected. I take it this is the auspicious Mr. Kim. Well, in my book, you're just another blood-sucking parasite. No different than a parasitic worm, a leech, a tick, or even more appropriately, the lice found on those most dirty and filthy. You're no more special than the parasite that causes dysentery. You know what that is? That's the shits, Mr. Kim. A vampire, huh? Big fucking deal. Rolling in shit. That's you. There was a long pause. Did I get under the fucker's skin? Good, I thought. Some tough talk, Mr. Walker. Kim resumed. You wouldn't sound so tough if we were in a room alone. Just you and I. Face to face. I'd have you soiling yourself before getting down on all fours, begging to die. You are what, uh, 21 years old? You should have a long life ahead, Mr. Walker. No need to throw it away for nothing, or the lives of your two friends. Turn back now. If you don't, you will die most horribly, I assure you. Before I could speak again, there was a click, and the line went dead. I was a bit shaken up as I hung up the phone. Steve and Tom were staring at me, eyes wide. Then, a flurry of questions from both. Was that the vampire? How did he know we were in town? Shit, how did he even know this motel and our fucking room number? I put my hand up. Okay, okay, everyone, calm down, I said, knowing my own voice was far from calm. It was Kim. He knows our purpose, why we're here. He even knew my name, for Christ's sake. We've been compromised, Jack, Tom exclaimed, and now we've lost all element of surprise. Either Kim had some damn good intelligence of his own, or there's a leak somewhere in the Magnus hierarchy. Jack, Steve said, this is fucked up. We need to speak with Simon, like, yesterday. Yeah, agreed Tom, but we can't wait around here for him to call. They know what room we're in. Kim might not come but he can send his goons here. We need to be ready if that happens. With that, he pulled out a 12-gauge shotgun from one of his rifle bags and began loading it. All right, I said, quickly throwing on my shoulder holster, which held a 45 caliber SIG P220. Let's get the hell out of here and to another place. I'll leave another message for Simon when we get there. We quickly gathered our things and left the room. Steve and Tom went to load the car while I went to the office to check out. While doing so, I asked the desk clerk about the call. You just patched a call through to my room, uh, room 313, I said. The caller didn't know my room number, so I assumed he asked for me by name. The clerk thought for a moment, and then said, No. When I answered the call, he just asked for room 313. I guess he had it already. I, uh, okay. Thanks. I said, and started to turn away. Then the clerk said, Maybe it was the same guy that came by earlier. I froze. What? I asked. Yeah, provided the clerk. About three hours ago, some dude came by, a really big Asian guy in a suit, asked what room uh, Jack Walker, uh, you, were staying in. I told him you were in 313. I assumed you were expecting him, No. I left the office and headed quickly to the car. Tom was already behind the wheel and Steve was riding shotgun. I got in. It's worse than we thought, I told them. They've already been here, just a few hours ago. Some goon came to the office asking for me by name. 
The asshole clerk gave him our room number. They could have hit us in our room, and we wouldn't even know they were coming. Let's get out of here, now. We spent the next hour driving a circuitous route through Atlanta to make sure we weren't being followed. When we were comfortable that we were alone, we located another motel where we could hunker down for the night. This one was even sleazier than the first, but we needed a place that would accept a bogus name without asking for ID when registering, and would also accept cash without any raised eyebrows. The weak link was our car. It was too late to try to visit a used car lot to swap it out. The best we could do was to park it in a secluded spot away from the motel. The whole time we were looking over our shoulders, expecting Kim himself to come at us. Once we were checked in, I called the cutout number. This time, Simon picked up the phone directly. What's going on? He asked, without preamble. I called the number you left, and they said you had checked out in a hurry earlier this evening. Sure the fuck did, I replied. Just after sunset, I got a call. I thought it was you. Imagine my surprise when the fucking target called me. A long pause. Then Simon simply said, Kim. Not a question. You bet your ass, I replied. And he knew my name, Simon. Obviously knew the motel and the room. He called to warn me, told me to back off, said if I didn't, I would die horribly. Steve and Tom were there when he called, so we got the fuck out of there, quick. Simon thought a minute, then asked, Could he have seen you? Did he go by his place? Yes, I replied. We did a recon of his home and business that day, but no way did he pick up on our vehicle or track us back to the motel. We're not that sloppy, Simon. If you are correct, Simon said slowly, the alternative is not a good one. It means Kim got tipped off by someone who knew where you were. I can't believe anyone on our end would have done that. Well, I retorted, the three of us think you have a leak, and now Kim knows we're here. The cards were already stacked against us because Kim isn't a normal target. He's not just a rogue living in a sewer. He lives in a guarded community and he has protectors, several armed and highly trained security guards. Now he knows we're here and coming for him. I understand, replied Simon. As soon as I hang up, I'm going to call the Magnus Elders and declare an emergency. The events thus far are completely unprecedented. If there is a leak, my friend, I can guarantee we'll find it. And then, in a tone of voice I had never heard from Simon before, he said, And that leak will be plugged permanently. He continued. And I'm going to send someone out there immediately to assist you. Another human, one of my familiars, and my best bodyguard. They can be there by tomorrow afternoon. Together, I think you can effectively deal with Kim. This is going to be the first time we ever had a combined team. But no doubt the elders will approve. In dire times, extreme measures are required. What is your motel address? They will be there tomorrow. With that, I gave Simon the address and our number. Steve, Tom, and I ended up pulling shifts that night, staying awake and keeping a watch on the motel parking lot. In the year we've been killing off the Mortis, never had we had to fear so much for our safety, especially when we were away from the Mortis nests. This was a first. While on my watch, I stood and stared out the room's window. As I took in the city's horizon, there was something about the way the night's shadow seemed to creep along the moonlit streets and around the tall buildings. I had an irrational fear that they seemed almost predatory in their approach. The black shadows cast from the lampposts looked like long, grasping fingers stretching towards my window. I could imagine Kim out there, in the darkness, watching me at the window, savoring our situation and tasting our fear. How did Kim learn we were coming for him? 
who tipped him off. His call, his voice, and his threat kept playing again and again in my mind. I slept fitfully that night. Finally, dawn came, and we knew at least the danger from Kim was gone. But that didn't mean one of his goons couldn't come by to make a preemptive strike. We kept our vigilance up until a little after three in the afternoon when a van pulled up outside our motel room. It was a white, nondescript cargo van, windowless, the type used by commercial businesses. The driver backed the van up so the rear doors were facing our door. Steve, Tom, and I opened the door and stepped out onto the landing, warily eyeing the driver, who was a huge guy, dressed in a suit and wearing a chauffeur's cap. I could see his large biceps straining against the sleeves of his suit. He shut off the engine, but didn't make any moves to get out of the van. He just stared straight ahead, with his hands on the wheel. Then, suddenly, the two rear doors abruptly swung open, making us all jump. I expected to see another goon to make his appearance, but was totally taken aback when instead, a girl jumped out of the back. And oh my god, what a girl. I've always been a lover of music, and the first thing that flashed through my mind were the lyrics to that classic 1977 Motown hits by the Commodores. She's a break. And indeed she was. She was tall, about six foot two, long blonde hair tied back in a bun, solidly athletic, tanned with piercing, bright blue eyes. My first impression was that she had a striking resemblance to the Danish model and actress Bridget Nielsen. Her exquisite face, marked by a Romanesque nose and full lips, was only marred by a one-inch scar to the right of her left eye. She was older than me. I was guessing in her mid to late twenties. She was wearing cargo pants with a black t-shirt. Her ample breasts were barely covered by a herringbone sports coat. As she jumped out, for a split second I could see the butt of a pistol in a shoulder holster under her coat. Although undeniably voluptuous, she was clearly no Barbie girl. You Jack Walker? she asked, giving me a piercing look, and somehow picking me out correctly from the three of us. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Jack Walker. Uh, that'd be me. Uh, Jack, uh, uh, Jack Walker. I knew I was stammering, but damn, I was distracted by her looks, as well as her no-nonsense demeanor. I heard Steve snicker next to me. Asshole, I thought. Good, she said, not batting an eye. I'm Roxy, Simon's personal assistant. I'll be working with you as we, uh, tackle this unique situation together. Glad to meet you, I said. And, uh, this is Steve and Tom. Introducing each in turn. Roger, she replied. I've read all your biographies. Steve, Tom, and I shot each other's sideways glances. Tom, still the no-nonsense cop, smirked and replied with a, So, what'd my bio say? that I'm the warm and sensitive type. Actually, Roxy reported, you've had trouble with relationships. You were married once, five years, and divorced. You've only dated a handful of times since then before leaving the force, and none of them lasted more than six months each. Most of your ex-girlfriends cited your lack of affection, even attention, because you were married to the job. And obviously, that was where your heart really was. You became a police officer after the murder of your father, an LAPD detective. According to a department shrink, you have a lot of guilt associated with your father's death. During the course of your career, you had 26 commendations, half of those from gallantry in the line of duty. You once took a bullet for your partner during an arrest that went bad. Later, you successfully rescued a mother and her three children for an armed hostage situation, for which she received the police medal for heroism. You left Vice for Homicide because you felt there was no higher calling to be the advocate for the victims that were no longer alive. You would do anything 
leave no stones unturned to solve a homicide case. You received three reprimands for ignoring instructions from superiors because you felt they were caving into politics instead of taking care of the victims. Your most serious charge was when you put a suspect in the murders of several children in the hospital with twelve broken bones after he supposedly resisted arrest. You won't hesitate to skirt the very laws you swore to uphold if that's what it takes to catch a murderer. For nearly two years, you saw a therapist after raiding the home of a predator and finding sexually abused and mutilated bodies of seven girls that he had abducted. You saw a gastrologist once for stomach ulcers that developed due to the stress of the job. You have a very high IQ and have a very intuitive and instinctive mind which has made you a great interrogator. You tested as an INTJ on the Myers-Briggs personality test. You always carry two handguns. As your primary, you ditched your old Smith & Wesson Model 27 revolver and now carry a Colt 1911A1 carried in Condition 1, cocked and locked. A bit old school, but then again, you are a traditionalist. You carry your backup piece, a Smith & Wesson Chief Special in an ankle holster. Rocky next turned to Steve and started to say, And with you, you have... When Steve quickly threw up his hands and exclaimed, Hey, uh, no, that's okay. I'm good. I I'm fine. Uh, please, don't need to hear the details. Thank you very much. Tom, still fuming over Roxy's off-the-cuff expose, grumbled. What's the matter, Steve? You got more to hide than just the book on your beach bum girlfriends? Look, I said, taking a step up to Roxy. She was intimidating but I wasn't going to show it. I was pissed and only getting angrier. You can dig up all the personal shit on us that you want, but I know all I need to know about you. I don't like vampires. That's why I've made a career of killing them. And by extension, I don't like familiars. In my book, you're just one step down from one of them. You already drank their blood to affirm your loyalty. You aspire to be just like them. What is it? The power? The immortality? What is it that would be worth becoming an undead, and having to take another creature's blood to survive? I have sympathy for an innocent that becomes a vampire not of their own choice, but a familiar? That's a small step up from dog shit as far as I'm concerned. For a moment, I had a sense of satisfaction when I could see my words had hit home. Roxy's composure slipped, just for a second, as she averted her eyes and looked down, her lips quivering. Then she looked back up and asked softly, almost in a whisper, But yet, you loved a vampire, didn't you? Her comment gave me pause, my anger quickly subsiding. Thoughts of Bethany came rushing back. Our love and our time together, and her last request for me to join the Magnus in their fight against the Mortis. Roxy was a familiar, but she was a Magnus, and we were on the same team. I had to keep my personal feelings in check. I felt a pang of guilt from my harsh words. Yes, I did. She was fun, warm, and generous. And as you probably know, she gave up her life to save me, and so that I may continue her quest to hunt down the Mortis. And I'll admit, that's probably my only reason for living. It's my raison d'etre. And the current target appears to be the most dangerous and formidable we've encountered so far. I know you're just here to help. I'm sorry for what I said. I held out my hand. Roxy smiled, gave me a nod, and took it. Her grip was firm, her hand warm. Little did I know... That handshake would begin a bizarre turn of events which added more intrigue to our already chaotic and insane lives. Okay, said Steve. Now that everyone's copacetic, should I go get Roxy her room for the night, then get down to discussing our matters at hand? We all nodded and began to turn. Tom then cut in. Wait a sec, so what's with the large van? He asked Roxy, curiously. Oh, yes, she said. 
Let me show you. She walked over and opened the rear doors to expose what looked like the inside of a SWAT van. The sides of the vehicle were lined with gun racks. Tom whistled as we all took stock of the inventory. In the locked racks were long guns, handguns, automatic weapons of all calibers, bolt-action sniper rifles, pistols, and rifles with silencers. You name it, it was there. Roxy opened a few boxes to show us tons of ammunition, extra magazines, grenades, mines, and packages of C4. My god, said Tom, clearly impressed. i never seen such firepower, either in law enforcement or with the gangs we may have busted. It's enough for a small-scale war. Roxy smiled and said, Simon hired me as his chief bodyguard specifically because of my backgrounds. I like to be prepared. I was told Kim's bodyguards were well-armed and well-versed in the martial arts. I think we'll be able to neutralize them without too much trouble. I folded my arms and said, bluntly, All well and good, but none of this will help kill the main target, Kim. Quite true, Roxy replied. First and foremost, as a familiar, my role is to protect the Magnus vampires. I have no expertise in killing them, even the Mortis. Simon said you were the experts. You had the experience and the tools, he said. I can help you clear the way to get to him, but in the end, you'll have to kill him. I thought of our own arsenal of vampire fighting weapons and Bethany's sacred knife. Okay, I concurred. That sounds fine to me. After getting personally threatened by that creep, I'm going to enjoy sending him straight to hell. As Roxy closed the rear doors of the van, Steve asked, But what about the driver? Don't worry about him, Roxy smiled. He likes to keep to himself. When dinner time came around, we ordered Chinese takeout to my room. It gave us a chance to get to know Roxy a bit better. She confided that she grew up in the world's cherry capital, a place called Traverse City in northern Michigan, along the Great Lakes. Fairly small town, but one that exploded with tourists every summer that would come for the beaches, boating, and, since 1925, the National Cherry Festival. And, strangely enough, for the fudge. Apparently, there were fudge shops all over town. As such, over time, the townies began calling the summer tourists fudgies. Roxy was raised by loving and devoted parents as their only child. Growing up on Lake Michigan, she practically lived in the water and became a certified scuba diver. Her father introduced her to guns and hunting as a teenager. After the Great Blizzard of 1978, Roxy decided she had enough with the cold and snow and enlisted in the U.S. Army Military Police. She did two years, one of those with the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea, where she saw service up at the DMZ between the North and South. Once Roxy got out of the Army, she went to work as a private security operative with a company based out of Utah. When I got to the point where she had met Simon and had become his familiar, she became reticent to provide further details. Perhaps it was because of my obvious distaste, as expressed in my harsh words earlier, or because it was too personal. Probably a bit of both. She would only allude to the fact that she had met Simon during one of her security gigs, and that was less than a year ago. I came to the conclusion that she was like an extra appendage to Simon, never beyond arm's reach, and was, of course, his primary bodyguard and protector during the vulnerable daylight hours and no doubt fiercely loyal. What was still hard for me to wrap my mind around was how one strikes a deal like that. I had grown to respect Simon over the past year, and even to like him, but I still couldn't understand how Roxy would want to become an undead being like him. My thoughts were interrupted as Roxy suddenly became rigid and said, He's awake now. She clearly had a mental link with Simon. He's going to call you soon. True to Roxy's word, the phone rang a few minutes later. 
Steve was able to rewire the old motel phone with an auxiliary speaker, so we were able to have a conference call of sorts. Hey, Simon, I greeted. We got Roxy here, along with Steve and Tom. Everyone's been acquainted, and Roxy's filled us in on her, uh, unique qualifications. That's great, everyone, Simon replied. Jack, before I fill you in from my end, could you please go into further detail on exactly what transpired? I'd like to hear exactly what was said during that phone conversation with Kim. I then proceeded to brief Simon on everything that had taken place since we rolled into Atlanta. When we got to Kim's phone call, Simon asked several questions. I told him what Kim had said, word for word. He was definitely trying to scare you off, Simon finally said. No shit, jumped in Steve. And he did a pretty good fucking job of it. Yeah, I chimed in. The scariest part was that one of his minions had been to the motel office a few hours before, checking us out. We could have been ambushed then, in complete surprise. Simon thought about it, then replied. I don't think they'd want to do anything violent right there in your motel. Remember, this is right in the middle of Kim's business district, and I don't think he felt it very wise to make a news story of three guys killed in a local motel. Too much visibility. And he probably got a great deal of satisfaction in letting you know that he knows about you. He thinks he's got the upper hand. Okay, acknowledged Tom. But let's cut to the chase here. How'd Kim learn about us? Well, strike that. I'm sure vampires of the Mortis clan have pretty much heard about us by now, since we've taken out several of their kind in the past year. Or for fuck's sake, how did he know we were here, in Atlanta, now, and looking for him? There's a fucking leak in your organization, Simon. It's the only answer. I agree with Tom, I said. You gave us this assignment just a week ago. We dealt with no one while we prepped to come, except our usual clergy contacts to load up on holy water. After arriving here, we did a reconnaissance of Kim's home and workplace, but that wasn't how they found out about us. The goons that came to the motel did so when we were still away, so it wasn't a question of following us. And how did he know my name, Simon? And my age? That never came up during any of our other attacks on their enclaves. And he knew I had two other friends, Steve and Tom. No. The way I see it, someone tipped Kim off that the famous vampire slayers were in town, and that we were coming for him. There's an informant in your ranks, Simon. I could hear Simon sigh, and he admitted. Yes. We all realized that right after you called. The elders were very alarmed, and I could say quite frankly, this is the largest crisis our clan has faced since what we call the Blood Purge took place back in 1962. It was more of an attempted purge, actually. It was an unprecedented and surprise attack on the Magnus clan by members of the Mortis. We had already been hunting down the Mortis for several decades because of their threats to humankind and to our own existence. Bethany, as you know, had been tracking Alexandria for years, through Europe and later here to the U.S. One thing we always had in our favor was that the Mortis vampires historically were unorganized isolationists, seemingly without any networking or having developed the power or influence of a disciplined group. But we were wrong. The Mortis had indeed formed a loose alliance between many of their kind, and eventually that group felt strong enough to take out the leadership of the Magnus and remove any resistance to their continued expansion here in North America. Over a three-day period, they attacked and killed over thirty prominent Magnus vampires all across the country. It was a wake-up call to the Magnus elders. If the Mortis had succeeded in neutralizing our clan, any obstacles to their dominance over the human race would have been removed. We knew then that we had to ramp up our efforts to eliminate their evil presence. One of the steps taken was to enlist the help of you humans, to give us a force multiplier with the ability to kill the Mortis during the daylight when they are at their most vulnerable. We also attempted to infiltrate their clan with our own people, as well as develop informants from within their own ranks. That program, I'm afraid, met with limited success. 
Too many of our assets were uncovered and eliminated. Now, ironically, what seems to be the case is that the Mortis have succeeded in penetrating us with their own assets. And, frankly, gentlemen, it has completely caught us off guard. At this point, we have no idea who the Mole is, or where he is. Everyone is on high alert and scrubbing every bit of communication that has taken place on the Kim case to give us some clues. Everyone will be looked at, including myself. Trust me, everyone. And sooner or later, we'll find him. The elders told me to convey to you their gratitude for what you have done so far to make the world safer, and they are sorry you were put in danger. Well, more than usual. Meanwhile, our priority is to get rid of Kim. After the Blood Purge of 62, we had decimated the Mortis to an extent where they became isolationists once again. By the early 1970s, their networking was sufficiently destroyed. Our fear is that Kim will be the new catalyst to develop the Mortis into an even worse collective, one that is highly organized and connected. I can say that we now consider him the most dangerous Mortis since Alexandria. If Simon meant to elicit an emotion in me with the comparison of Alexandria, he succeeded. Nothing could generate my anger or stimulate my thirst for revenge more than the mere mention of her name. I didn't have the pleasure of killing Alexandria because of Bethany's sacrifice, but this time around... I really wanted to be the one to personally cut off Kim's head and sending the Mortis a signal that Jack Walker wasn't anyone they can fuck with. I looked at Steve and Tom, who both nodded, and then told Simon, You just tell the elders to find the mole. We're ready to take care of Kim, and I don't see any point in waiting. I think we should go in now, tonight or tomorrow. What do you think? I doubt that Kim would be at his house tonight, replied Simon. He will probably be out on the prowl, either looking for a victim or looking for you. The night is his time. He won't waste it sitting at home. No, your best chance of getting him is in the day, when he is resting and off his game. You'll have to kill him there, on his own turf. I know you'll have to go through Kim's bodyguards first. However, I sent Roxy to give you guys a force multiplier. She is well versed in martial arts herself, and she is a weapons expert and marksman. She is no stranger to fights. She has been in skirmishes before, and I'm told her opponents never lived to see another day. I stole a glance at Roxy. She obviously basked in her master's praise, and her lips were pursed with a cool smile. I had no doubt that she could be ruthlessly efficient. It was hard to rationalize how a woman so sexy and beautiful could be so deadly. My mind flashed with the comparison of Roxy with the James Bond villain Xenia on the top. Beauty and death in one package. I'm planning on going with a Heckler and Koch MP5, Roxy said. A submachine gun fires a 9mm cartridge at a rate of 800 rounds per minute. Mine is silenced and equipped with a 100-round Beta C-Mag drum. I'll also be carrying a 9mm Smith & Wesson Model 59 as backup. And, if things get really ugly, I always carry a few M67 fragmentation grenades. Very nice, exclaimed Tom, with that continued look of professional admiration on his face. Enough firepower to take out a small army. That leaves us with the main weapons to take down Kim. We have three high-pressure, high-volume water cannons filled with sanctified and blessed holy water, several water pistols modified for high pressure carrying the same. Each of us will have our own grenades, ultra-thin plastic that's designed to break on contact filled with holy water. We'll definitely have the firepower once Kim gets cornered. I... just one concern, jumped in Steve. Even with the silenced weapons, with all this firepower... It's going to be messy and noisy. In a gated community, any disturbance is going to quickly draw police attention, especially at nearly 7 in the morning. We'll be lucky to get out unseen, if not detained. Even if we get away, with five dead people in the house of a prominent Atlanta businessman, you know this will hit the news big time, and the police will leave no stone unturned to find the shooters. 
Do you have a plan in place to get us out and handle any of the fallout? Simon gave a chuckle. Why, Steve, ye of little faith. Don't worry. We have some co-optees in the Atlanta PD. When they find the bodies, they are prepared to make the killings look like a case of home invasion gone bad. It will go smoothly as long as you are out of there. I'm hoping you can be in and out within 15 minutes. Since the home is near the perimeter, you should be out of the community way before the police arrive. It should be easy. Do you ever have that happen when someone says, Don't worry, it'll be a piece of cake. Or, Don't worry, it'll go smoothly. Or the very worst one, Don't worry, trust me. That you know right then and there, deep down, that you're going to get fucked. Like you might as well bend over right then and get it over with. That's how I felt at that moment. The whole plan felt too easy. Kim didn't strike me as the type to go quietly, nor be underestimated. Like how I had underestimated Alexandria when I had her cornered in that California cavern. When I stepped on that booby trap and learned that something that had survived as long as her would of course have some escape plan. But there was so little I could say at that point. We were out of time and out of options. I just prayed to God, that even if Simon was incapable of doing so, that everything was going to work out. It was finally agreed that we launched the attack on Kim's home just after dawn. After ending the call, the four of us continued to wargame the attack on Kim's residence for the next few hours. At midnight, we took a break. As Steve and Tom took out their packs and cases to inventory and prepare our weapons, I stepped outside to get some fresh air. A few minutes later, I felt a presence beside me. It was Roxy. Because of the hot motel room, she had taken off her sports coat. Her t-shirt clearly showed off her ample breasts. She was wearing some perfume that smelled like jasmine. Her blue eyes sparkled in the moonlight. I always had a thing for athletic girls, and it had been over a year since I had last been with Bethany. I could feel my groin stir. Christ, I thought. Steve would have a field day. He's always accusing me of thinking with my little head. And this girl was a familiar. She belongs to Simon. I needed to remain professional. More importantly, I needed to remain loyal to Bethany. A bit warm in there, Roxy said, as she stood, facing me. Yeah, it is, I agreed. She gave me an appraising look, her eyes lingering on mine a bit too long. I... Uh, something on your mind? I asked. I was just curious, she said. Just how many Mortis vampires did you kill during the past year? I thought about it for a minute then answered. I never really kept count. I guess well over a hundred. Roxy flashed a look that I couldn't quite make out. Was it surprise, or was it revulsion? Does that bother you? I asked. I thought you were the badass. She looked like she struggled for an answer. As I mentioned, I never killed a vampire before. She finally explained. Simon's been doing it for centuries, but I only became his, uh, familiar a few months ago. And we haven't been on any missions during that time where I might have been put into that situation. My main goal as his chief bodyguard is to protect him in the day when he's asleep from mostly human risks. So this will be my first time at witnessing the death of a vampire. I thought her response a bit odd. She appears to be reticent about killing a vampire, yet she had no qualms about taking out the human familiars. She didn't strike me as having any qualms about killing anybody, but there's no denying killing vampires is a totally different experience. Well, I offered. I found it easy enough. Vampires dead anyway, in a sense, and the Mortis are pure parasites, pure evil. A threat to humankind. You, your friends, your family. They're killing machines. 
and only out for their pure gratification with no thought to any morality. I don't shed a tear for any of them as I cut off their heads. Again, that flash of revulsion, or was it even anger? I wasn't sure. But then it hit me. As a familiar, someday, she would be a vampire herself. Perhaps she's wrestled with the idea of killing a being that she herself would someday become. Yeah, Roxy replied softly. I get it. I'm sure I'll be ready if the time ever comes. A pause. Then, she said. Jack, I know what you think of familiars. She edged closer to me. Her plump breasts were almost touching my chest. But remember, we are still human, with human emotions. We've made a choice in life, taken a fork in the road to pursue our own path. Maybe a good path, maybe bad, no different than anyone else. I hope you never hold that against me. She put her hand on my shoulder. I have feelings, and I miss being with... a man. Roxy leaned in, and I could feel her soft lips brushing against mine. Her breasts pushed into me, and I could feel her groin against my own. Before I knew what I was doing, I put my arms around her waist and pulled her in tighter. We kissed. There was nothing gentle about it. We both kissed hungrily, with pure desire. Her tongue thrust against mine, hot and passionate. I returned it, and then some. I'm not sure how long it went on. For several minutes, my mind went blank with pleasure. Only when someone coughed nearby was I startled out of my reverie. It was Steve. Hey, guys, I hate to, uh, break things up, but Tom and I came up with a few things we wanted to run past you. Roxy stood straight, regaining her composure, and once again transformed into the cool, restrained professional. Yes, of course. She curtly said to Steve as she walked back towards the room. Steve just stood there, giving me a shit-eating grin. Fuck me. I thought. All right, I said. Go ahead, have your fun. Steve laughed and held up his hands. Dude, seriously, I'm not judging. Roxy's one sexy lady, and I know you've been hurting since Bethany. It's about time you play the field, but... But what? I asked. She's a familiar, man. Doesn't that mean she really belongs to Simon? And anyway... She'll probably be a vampire someday. It doesn't sound good for a long-term relationship. I just think you should be careful. Keep your head in the right place. I looked at my oldest friend and gave him a nod. Sage advice, bro. I'll try to keep my testosterone in check. It's just that I'm such a stud, you know. Steve threw his arm around my shoulder as we walked back toward the room. A regular Don Juan. How you get the girls without my surfer boy good looks, I'll never know. Despite Steve's note of caution, I couldn't help but ponder Roxy's sudden overture to me. Despite her tough exterior, she seemed so vulnerable, so in need of... What? Companionship? Love? I didn't know how to read it. And was she merely Simon's bodyguard, or was there a sexual component between them? That didn't seem to be the case, based on her coming on to me. Maybe Magnus vampires treated their familiars differently than the mortars, I mused. I admit it, I was baffled, but there was no time to dwell on it. A few hours later, after changing into all-black clothing, we had our car packed up with our gear and were ready to go. As we pulled out of the motel parking lot, I noticed Roxy's chauffeur driver still sitting behind the wheel of the van. Who's the driver? I asked Roxy. I don't think this guy has even left the driver's seat since you arrived. His name is Martin, Roxy replied. His job is to protect the arsenal. 
He'll never leave its side while we are away. For the rest of the ride, we had little conversation. When we got to Kim's gated community, we drove to the most secluded side of the property, on the far side away from the access gates, and parked on a residential street we had noted during our reconnaissance. At nearly four in the morning, the street was dark, with all residents safely in bed. From there, we cut through the property of a home with a for-sale sign in the front yard, walked through a small wooded area until we came to a low stone wall. We didn't even need each other's help to scale it. In less than thirty seconds, we were all over the other side, with our backpacks and weapons. So much for the concept of a gated community, I mused again. We'd picked this part of the wall because it was also the closest to Kim's home, and we wouldn't have to walk too far and risk any observation. Time for the masks, Roxy reminded, as she put on her own black ski mask. We walked briskly in single file, staying in the shadows of buildings and bushes as much as possible. Only once did one security light pop on in someone's yard, triggered by our passing. We waited in the nearby darkness until about two minutes later when the light switched off. We continued on our way. In another minute, we reached the edge of the community golf course. After making sure no early birds were around, we crossed the fairway. As we crossed one of the greens, I noticed it was the thirteenth hole. Oh, that's a nice omen, I heard Steve mutter as we crossed. Soon, after entering the tree line on the other side, we reached a small gazebo in the wooded area between the community's golf course and the streets where Kim's house is located. We had scouted it out on the earlier recon and knew it was relatively secluded and hidden from the homes. We were in total darkness, as the area was covered in trees and the nearest street light was some distance away. The gazebo would serve as our rally point when we left the home. We checked out our gear one last time. In addition to our vampire fighting tools, Steve and Tom had chosen several fully automatic weapons of their choice from Roxy's arsenal. I had chosen a Remington semi-auto 12-gauge shotgun, in addition to the SIG P220 in my shoulder rig. We made sure we all had our crucifixes around our necks. In a large pouch, I had the Thompson family Bible from Mike's mom, Ida. It had saved my life, and Tom's, in one of our encounters with the vampire queen, Alexandria. Although it was heavy, I never went into a vampire's den without it. Lastly, I made sure I had Bethany's knife, with which I would use to render the fatal blow to kill Kim. All right, then, I said. As we agreed, Roxy and I will circle the house on the right and go to the front door. She can take care of any bodyguards near the entrance, and then we'll immediately head down the stairs to the basement where the best chances are to find Kim. Tom and Steve, you guys come in the back and take care of anyone there. As soon as you know the first and second floor are secure, come join us in the basement to make sure Kim is dead. Any questions? I think we all had a thousand questions, but at this point, it was now or never. We all nodded in agreement and uniformly gave the group a fist pump. We were ready. In just a few minutes, the sun was beginning to rise. Daylight. We left the gazebo and traversed through the wood line that bordered the back of five homes until we came to Kim's house. Steve, Tom, it's almost 7.03. At 7.05, go in. We had previously synchronized our watches, that gave Roxy and I two minutes to get around to the front of the house. Bro, said Steve, looking at me with pure emotion. Be careful. I don't want to be stuck alone with Grandpa here. His head tilted towards Tom. Tom scowled, and I knew he was about to tell Steve to go fuck himself, but he simply said, Yeah, kid. I don't want to have to babysit surfer boy here, so make sure your ass doesn't get lit up. You too, Roxy. I smiled. I loved both those guys. You too, I said. And then Roxy and I made our move. 
We passed low on the side of the house, and seconds later we were at the front door. Roxy paused, looking into my eyes, and whispered, Everything will be okay, Jack. I'm with you all the way. And whatever happens, remember that I'll always have your back. Her display of emotion at that moment caught me off guard, but the look in her eyes told me it was with conviction. Before I could respond, she placed a bubblegum-sized shaped charge on the door lock, already prefabricated with an electric detonator. I followed her lead and stood to the side of the door. Then, right on cue, she detonated the device. It was so small, it blew the lock apart with surprisingly very little sound, and the door almost opened by itself. We quickly yet silently stepped in, as nonchalant as if we really lived there. Kim's main bodyguard, Shin, was sitting in a chair in the front room, apparently in the process of reading a newspaper, which he was now dropping to the floor. He barely had time to process what he was seeing when Roxy let loose with a burst from her silenced MP5. The 9mm rounds tore into Shin's chest and neck, spraying blood and gore all over the Asian folding screen behind him. Shin's fresh blood further accented the beautiful blood-red sunset depicted on the silk screen. He was dead even before he toppled over and hit the floor. Almost simultaneously, we saw the other bodyguard, Park, come running down the hallway, reaching under his jacket for his pistol. Before he could get off a shot, Roxy let loose with a full five-second burst that made Park jerk and dance like a dysfunctional puppet with a severed control string. At the end of the fusillade, his shredded body crashed to the hallway floor in a heap. Shit, I muttered. Roxy didn't skip a beat. Come on, she said. Basement's down the hall. We continued halfway down the hall, sidestepping Park's corpse. Roxy kept her MP5 trained on the far end of the hallway. We could hear muffled shooting on the far side of the house. I prayed to God Steve and Tom had gotten the drop on the third bodyguard, Han. We came to a room on the left, and Roxy held up a hand to have me pause behind her. She peeked quickly around the corner before stepping in. It was the library. Bookcases extended wall to wall and floor to ceiling, and looked to be filled with a vast repository of antiquarian and rare books. Standing behind a large desk in the corner was a very petite Asian girl, perhaps in her late twenties. She was unarmed, but she was giving us a glare that could only be described as pure hatred. It was Lee, the secretary. Roxy, I started to say, but she walked over to the cowering girl before I could finish. I expected her to kill the girl as ruthlessly and efficiently as she dispatched Shin and Park, but to my relief, she took the MP5 and smacked the girl in the side of the head. Lee crumpled and fell to the floor. She'll live, said Roxy. I was grateful for that, as I followed Roxy out. A few seconds later, we reached the end of the hallway and could see the stairs leading to the basement. We were getting close. We made our way downstairs, cautiously. It wasn't like going down narrow, dark stairs in some creepy abandoned home. The steps were carpeted, and the area was well lit by overhead, recessed lighting. It certainly didn't feel like I was descending into a vampire's lair. When we reached the bottom, I could hear footsteps on the floor above. Apparently, Steve and Tom had taken care of the last guard and were checking the house. Things were going well, but we still hadn't found Kim. Simon had said Kim's sleeping area was down here, but it was a large, finished basement, and it was a large house. We had to look room by room. The first area was a large entertainment room with a massive wet bar. Nothing. We went on to another area which turned into a theater with seats and a projection screen. Nothing. This led to some bedrooms which took yet more time to sweep and clear. Nothing. Finally, we came to a very large suite, 
which was only illuminated by burning candles. There were no windows, of course, but still, in the near dark, I could see the many oil paintings along the walls, each illuminated by small picture lights. I was no art expert, but something told me the paintings were probably priceless. The room contained a beautiful double pedestal oak desk and a wet bar in the corner. We quickly passed and entered the adjacent bedroom. As we entered, the shadows seemed to dance as the room was only illuminated by a large candlestick on a table. There, in the middle of the room, was a large canopy bed. It looked as ostentatious as the one used by the Sun King himself, French King Louis XIV. It had to be Kim's personal lair. We quickly scanned all around the room and in adjacent closet and bathroom. Nothing. Shit, Roxy. He's not here. We'll have to keep looking. I cursed. I was about to turn away when I noticed there was a large envelope on one of the pillows on the bed. I went over and picked it up. The envelope had only one word written on it, in neat calligraphy. Jack. Fuck, I cursed as I opened the envelope. I knew whatever the letter said, I wouldn't like it. Roxy looked intense as I unfolded the letter. It was from Kim. I read it out loud. Jack, my silly boy. Did you really think you could just waltz uninvited into my home and expect to find me lying in ignorant repose, like in some vampire movie, just waiting to be graced by your presence? Your Magnus benefactors sent you on a wild goose chase, Jack. You are just a pawn in their failed plans to rein in the vampires of the Mortis clan. They fear us, and therefore seek to control us. They never will. Soon, we will be the stronger. Death, Jack. Death, killing, rape, torture, depravity. Those are what makes us the stronger. You should stop looking for me, Jack. Rest assured, I will find you before you ever find me. Christ, I thought. Kim sure had an annoying flair for the melodrama. I folded the notes and put it in my pocket. I gave Roxy a defeated look. The bastard somehow knew we were coming, I said. But where would he be now? We hit the house almost exactly at sunrise. We'll figure it out later, Roxy replied. Let's sweep the rest of the house quickly, and then we better get the hell out of here. Roxy and I walked quickly back through the basements towards the stairs. Just as we neared them, something caught my eye. Wait a second, I told Roxy as I grabbed her arm. I noticed a small end table that was placed against one of the interior walls. On top of the table was a vase of flowers. What caught my eye was a few of the flowers had dropped to the floor. They seemed to be out of place in what was otherwise an impeccably clean room. As I got closer, I could see the table was affixed directly to the wall with some small hidden screws. Roxy pointed to the wall. There. There's a slight seam here. Look. It goes all the way around. It looks like a square. Shit, Jack. It's a door. She exclaimed. I grabbed the table and pulled. Sure enough, that section of the wall opened up to reveal a small door, opening to what appeared to be a tunnel, maybe leading to another room. Kim must have gone through here, I said. When he closed the door, some of the flowers dropped to the floor. Just then, Steve and Tom half ran down the stairs. I was relieved to see them as they looked unscathed. We took out Han, one of the bodyguards in the kitchen when we came in, Tom panted. Then we searched the whole house, just found the bodies you left, and the secretary. We tied her up and left her. Did you find Kim? No, I regretfully replied. No sign of Kim, or his deputy, Han. 
but the bastard left me a note. He had time to write it before we came in. Somehow he had a heads up that we were coming. Now he's in the wind. Roxy cut in. We should probably get out of the house as soon as we can. Any observant neighbor could have called the cops by now, but we need to check out this tunnel to make sure Kim's not holding up in there. I agreed. Steve, Tom, I directed. You guys should head out the back door and escape and evade back to the car. If the cops come, we don't need all four of us to be rolled up. Not with Kim still out there. Steve looked like he was going to object, as I knew he didn't want to leave me behind. No time to debate, bro, I said. Go. Steve squeezed my arm, relenting, and said, Okay, just be careful. Get out as soon as you can. As he and Tom headed back up the stairs, Roxy pulled out a high-powered pen light from her vest pocket. The girl was always prepared, I thought. Keep your water cannon at the ready. If Kim's cornered in here, we'll have him. With that, she stepped in. I followed and closed the hidden door behind me. I figured if the cops came in, we had a chance to hide out undetected. It was, indeed, a tunnel, or, more appropriately, a long corridor. The floor and walls were made of concrete. I could see it extending for about twenty feet. There were no light switches we could see, but, then again, a vampire doesn't need any artificial light. When we reached the end, it opened up into a room. Christ, I muttered as Roxy's flashlight beam illuminated what was obviously Kim's little laboratory of horrors. In the middle of the room was what appeared to be an autopsy table, recessed stainless steel with a drainage hole. Next to the table were several trays of nightmarish instruments, definitely not the type you'd find in a hospital operating room. I spotted a soldering iron, a pneumatic staple gun, a drill with a wire brush bit, a hot glue gun, a reciprocating saw, and several other monstrous items I could not identify. One tray held more mundane instruments, like scalpels, scissors, and clamps. At the head of the table was some sort of machine with tubing that led to the table, ending in what looked like an IV line that would be inserted into a body. Other tubes extended from the machine to IV bags that were suspended on a rack. He bleeds his victims dry in here, Roxy whispered, after he tortures them. He's one sick fuck, I said. The ultimate evil. It occurred to me that while Alexandria got off on the sex, seduction, and moral depravity, Kim was a monster motivated more by pain and torture. Both the same mortis vampire, yet so different. Of the two... I was beginning to realize Kim was much more dangerous. He was not just a sadistic killer. He was above suspicion, as he lived in respectability amongst humans in relative wealth and luxury. If more of the Mortis vampires followed his example, they would become highly organized and difficult to defeat. No wonder the Magnus elders were so worried. We left the room and continued to follow the corridor. After a few steps, we came to a second room, about half the size of the first. Roxy's light scanned the area, showing shelves stacked with bins that contained what looked like personal clothing, purses, wallets, and jewelry. Obviously, the personal effects that Kim took from his victims. Did he keep them as trophies, I wondered? No different than a common serial killer... I mused. We continued on and came to yet another room. I heard Roxy gasp as she looked inside. I came up alongside her, and what I saw left me momentarily stunned. The room was full of cages, perhaps thirty or more. They were small, like the kind you'd see at animal shelters, barely large enough for a large dog, let alone a human being. Yet, in one cage was a woman. She was confined into a fetal position. She looks to be in her thirties. She was naked, 
and thus it was easy to see the extent of her injuries. She had obviously already paid a visit to Kim's torture chamber. Her body was covered in burns and cuts. The area between her legs was a ruined mess. She had obviously been raped, and not by anything human. Mercifully, I could see she was dead. Roxy and I then heard a small moan from the other side of the room, and she immediately put her lights on the cage. In it was a small girl, maybe seven or eight. I thanked God she was still dressed, although her pajamas were covered in dirt and grime. From what I could see, she was unhurt. She had long brown hair that was dirty and matted over her face. It looked like she was starting to come around from some sort of anesthetic. Perhaps Kim drugged his victims so he could bring them back to the house. Then I got hit with an epiphany. How is Kim bringing his victims back here? I asked Roxy. Not to the front door, I imagine. I think this tunnel leads to the outside. I think you're right, Roxy replied. We'll find out soon enough and we can't leave this girl behind. Roxy looked like she was getting ready to shoot the lock off the girl's cage, but I grabbed her arm and said, Wait. I pointed over to the wall near the door, and there was a key hanging there. One key fits all, I guessed. Roxy snatched the key and inserted it into the lock. The cage clicked open. I'll carry her, I told Roxy. You lead the way. I gently picked up the girl, and we continued down the corridor. This time we didn't encounter any more rooms. After a few minutes, it was obvious we weren't under Kim's house anymore. We kept walking. About ten minutes later, the corridor came to a dead end, at a closed metal door. It was secured with two huge sliding deadbolts, one at the top and one at the bottom. Roxy slid both back and the door opened inwards. We stepped out into some sort of irrigation or drainage tunnel. I think this is under the golf course, Roxy surmised. I remember seeing a drainage ditch going under the wall not far from where we came in. Left or right, I asked. I think it would be this way, Roxy said, indicating the way to the right. We had to bend over a bit to traverse the tunnel. We walked for several minutes, our feet sloshing in the cold, ankle-deep water. The girl was starting to feel like dead weight, but for the life of me, I wasn't going to drop her. Hang on, honey, I told her. You're safe. I'm going to get you home. I could feel her tighten her arms around my neck. She had heard me, and she wasn't giving up either. At what seemed like an eternity, I could see daylight and the end of the tunnel. In another minute, we slogged out of the tunnel into the daylight. Roxy had called it perfectly. This section of the tunnel had run underneath the stone wall behind the golf course. We were now behind a residential area, not far from the car. We had made it out. We had to circumvent the back of a few homes to get back to the empty house with the for sale sign. We quickly ran to the car, where Steve and Tom were waiting. The relief on Steve's face was evident. He quickly threw open the rear door to allow us to pile in. God damn it, Jack, Steve fumed angrily. It's been over an hour. What the fuck took so long? Tom and I thought you were rolled up for sure. We were scared shitless. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you again too, bro, I retorted. I picked up a new friend. You guys wouldn't believe Kim's torture room. He's been a busy man. He feeds on this community like the evil parasite he is. Tom, Roxy cut in. Get us back to the motel. I don't want to keep all of us on the streets any more than necessary. You can drop us off, and then I'll take the van and drop the girl off at a hospital. There will be cameras at the ER, and I have extra plates for the van, so I'll be able to swap them out afterwards. We all agreed and Tom headed off for the motel. The sun was not even midway up in the sky. It was hard to believe it was just a little after ten. 
It had seemed like ages we were in the cesspool that was Kim's home. My only consolation was that all three of Kim's bodyguards were dead. At least his first barrier of defense was gone. Still, though, something about that nagged in my mind. I needed to think about what it meant, but my adrenaline rush was gone, and I just wanted to get back to the room and take a hot shower. It would probably take more than soap and water to wash away the evil residue from that house. When we all got to the motel, we all went to our separate rooms, except for Roxy, who left in her van, with Martin at the wheel, to take the girl to the hospital. Everyone agreed we'd get some much-needed sleep and reconvene at five, before sunset, and wait to speak with Simon. He wasn't going to like what we had to report. I undressed and jumped in the shower. When I was finished, I dressed in fresh jeans and a t-shirt. I desperately wanted a beer, even if it was noon, but all I had in the small motel fridge was cans of that new Bud Light stuff. I sighed and stretched out on the bed. It seemed way too large. Even a year later, I still missed Bethany's presence by my side. Some days were better than others, but on this particular day, I missed her all the more. The struggle against the Mortis, against Kim, it all seemed so daunting. Bethany had the inner strength I sometimes felt I was lacking. She was stronger than me. I knew if she was here, she would hold me and say all the right words, motivating me to continue. I felt a tear slip down my face, as miraculously, despite the horrors of the morning, I drifted off to a dreamless sleep. About three hours later, I awoke, and suddenly, very clearly, I realized what had been bugging me since leaving Kim's house. I decided I would go over and discuss it with Roxy. She was there at Kim's house and saw it herself. I got up, brushed my teeth, and slipped on a jacket. I left the room and went outside. The Atlanta sun was shining and the air was December cool. To those uninitiated with the evil all around them, it was a fantastic day. I walked over to the motel's exterior stairs and went up to the second level, where Roxy had gotten her room. I knocked on the door, feeling a bit guilty if I succeeded in waking her up. But, after the first series of knocks, she opened the door. She was wearing cut-off jeans which showed off her tanned and well-toned legs. Above was a fresh black t-shirt, although this time I could tell she wasn't wearing a bra underneath. Judging from her still damp blonde hair, now out of the bun and lying down over her shoulders and back, she had recently gotten out of the shower. Hi, Jack, she said, smiling, looking a bit surprised. You couldn't sleep? I smiled back. Well, I... I kept thinking about this morning. I want to run something past you. Uh, can I come in? Oh, sure, she replied. Make yourself at home. As she turned around, I couldn't help but notice how nicely her tight butt filled out those Calvin Klein jeans. Was she like Brooke Shields, who boasted that nothing came between her and her Calvins? I felt my groin stir, and I had to remind myself this was all business. Roxy took a seat and said, So you're probably wondering about the girl. I got her to a hospital a bit out of the area so as to not have her discovery be too close to Kim's home, just in case we needed to get back in there. And it was a good decision, because I learned on the police scanner there were no calls to the house today. Apparently, no one noticed or heard a thing. So, Kim will probably return there at some point. I don't think he can stay away from his torture room. I nodded. Yes, and that kind of leads me into what I wanted to run past you, I said. It was obvious that Kim's notes to me was written in advance. I mean, he had no time to write it once he heard the gunfire upstairs. You agree? Sure, replied Roxy. That sounds about right. Okay, then. I continued. So, he knew we were coming then, right? Roxy nodded. Yes, 
I guess we have to come to that conclusion. Exactly, I exclaimed. Kim knew that we were coming, probably from the Mortis Mole inside the Magnus clan. Yet, we nevertheless caught all of his security off guard. They were not prepared for an assault on the home in the slightest. The chief of security, Shin, was reading a newspaper for God's sake. The others were caught completely flat-footed as well. Don't you see? Kim knew we were coming, yet he didn't prepare his security crew for it. Or his secretary, apparently. Yet, that doesn't make sense. It's almost like Kim thought they were expendable. The only one that got away with him was on, his second-in-command. That means something, right? Roxy thought about it and nodded. Yes, I think you're right, Jack. That's some good thinking. We'll bring it up with Simon tonight. I stood up and turned towards the door. Jack, I heard Roxy say. I turned around. I just wanted to say that I think we made a good team today. I felt you really had my back. I felt comfortable with you. Roxy was now standing mere inches in front of me. I could see her nipples through her t-shirt. She put one hand on my shoulder, then stroked the back of my neck. I'm a familiar, Jack. But I admit, I'm drawn to you. I feel something different when I'm with you. Like I'm even more alive. I can't explain it. But I can't deny it. I don't know what Simon would think if he found out. I'm marked to be his, but the feelings I have for you are so different, so intense. Roxy leaned her head towards mine, but I pulled back. Roxy, I can't. I mean, you are sexy and beautiful and a hell of a partner, but I just can't. Not right now. She looked into my eyes for a few moments, and then asked, It's because of Bethany, isn't it? You still love her. But Jack, she was a vampire. I'm a real woman. Real flesh and blood. I'm here. Now. I whirled away. Yes. I mean, no. Damn it. I'm so confused. I blurted. Yes, you're right. Bethany is still in my heart. She sacrificed herself for me. I can't bear to betray her. And it's more than that. You're a familiar. You belong to Simon. And you're going to become a vampire someday, for Christ's sake. How can that ever be a good thing between us? I asked. Roxy smiled. You loved a vampire once, Jack. Maybe that's what it takes to get you to love me. Becoming a vampire. No, I said. That's nuts. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Don't think like that. I turned again for the door. I had just reached the doorknob when I felt a prick on the side of my neck. Then everything went dark. I struggled to open my eyes. My lids felt like lead. I could hear before I could open them to see. I could make out the strains of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. I shook my head from side to side, trying to clear my head. After a few moments, my eyes finally fluttered open, but not without a wave of nausea. My vision was fuzzy, and my head felt like it was going to explode. Drugged, I thought. I must have been drugged. But by whom? I was finally able to distinguish where I was. Some room, but not the motel. Very nice, very elegant. Nice paintings along the walls, posh furniture. A warm fire blazing in the fireplace. I could see a window, and I could see it was now dark. There was a shine of the moon coming in through the window. Shit. I thought, it's night. I've been out for hours. What the fuck happened? My senses were slowly coming back, and I could tell now that I was sitting in a chair. When I went to move my arms, I discovered that they were tied down at my sides. 
Ah, you're awake. A man walked in from behind me and went past the chair to my left. All I could see from his back was that he was tall, thin, and athletically built. He was wearing tan slacks and a preppy blue blazer. He walked over to a wet bar and poured what looked like whiskey into a tumbler. You know, Jack, it's a misnomer that vampires only drink blood. We can enjoy a good scotch with the rest of you. I knew the voice before he even turned around, of course. But when he did, I got my first look of Kim Song Ho in the flesh. My first thought was, he's actually a pretty handsome guy. He had a lean, sculptured face with an imperious nose. His thick black Asian hair was gelled and combed back. My second thought was, after seeing his coffee brown eyes framed by heavy patrician eyebrows, that it wouldn't be hard for this guy to charm any woman or be respected by any man. I watched as Kim sauntered over and took a seat in an easy chair across from me. Jack, I apologize for bringing you here so abruptly, but after all, it was you who so rudely broke into my house. I figured if you were so eager to meet with me, then I should make it happen. As my notes to you promised, I would find you before you would ever find me. Kim let out a chuckle. Where am I? Was all I could think to say. Oh, at one of my other houses in Atlanta. One that you didn't have information about. Foolish Jack. Did you really think I had only one sanctuary? I'm a bit inconvenienced that I won't be able to get back to my, shall we say, hobby room for a few days. But it's a trivial matter. What matters is that tomorrow night, here... In this place, we will usher in the beginning of the new Mortis dynasty, Jack. Up to now, the Mortis vampire clan has been virtually rudderless, with no sense of unity or direction. Without any organization, the Mortis has been fragmented, powerless. Our kind has been forced to live on their own, in the hidden underbellies of humankind. In the sewers, caves, and the forgotten urban blights of the inner cities. And the main facilitator of our misery has been the Magnus clan, Jack. Those sanctimonious pricks. The Magnus elders and their snobbish lackeys have held us back for centuries. Always looking at us with disdain and contempt. They label us as an ugly deviation of the vampire bloodline claiming that we are unsophisticated and inferior to them. Well, this will all change tomorrow night, Jack. I looked at Kim. He appeared rational and calm. Articulate, really. I figured the longer I kept him talking, the longer I might stay alive. So, what do you mean, a new dynasty? I asked. Do you know Korean history, Jack? Kim replied. My homeland was, for centuries, beset by wars between the local kingdoms, each sparring for dominance. Eventually, the smaller states and confederacies were absorbed, and there began what is known as the Three Kingdoms Period, so-called because it was dominated by the Three Kingdoms of Bekchi, Koguryo, and Shila. All three kingdoms shared a similar culture and language, and they lived in relative peaceful coexistence. However, the Shila kingdom recognized there needed to be a more centralized control of the Korean peninsula. Strength does not come from fragmented and isolated states, but from unified and organized states. Eventually, with the help of the Chinese Tang dynasty... Sheila was able to defeat its rivals and form a unified Korean state. This new dynasty was called the Unified Sheila Kingdom, and was the first dynasty to rule over the whole Korean peninsula. And in the following century, the kingdom would flourish and produce some of the finest art and architecture yet seen in ancient Korea. And what made this possible, Jack? Strong leaders with a vision... A vision to bring unification to their people, to empower them. 
Strength through numbers, Jack. And do you know who the leaders were of the new unified Sheila Kingdom? The Sheila Kings were dominated by the Kim clan. My ancestral clan, Jack. Do you see the parallels? Do you now understand my mission? I took a moment to answer. I thought Kim was at best a megalomaniac, at worst just totally insane. But I had to go along with it. You want to unite the independent vampires of the Mortis into a new, organized clan, under single leadership. Your leadership. Kim gave me a wide smile. Was it me, or did his teeth seem a bit longer than before? He was obviously getting excited. Yes, yes, of course, he exclaimed. It is my manifest destiny, Jack. My predecessors failed with the blood purge of the Magnus clan twenty years ago. But this time I will ensure we are better organized, better prepared before we strike again. This time we will decapitate the clan with one fast onslaught by killing every single elder in one night. Kim's cool facade was slipping. He was so hyper-excited about launching his new Mortis Vampire dynasty that he was almost giddy. That sounds very ambitious, I said. Something only a strong leader is able to do. And this will begin tomorrow night, you say? Yes, Kim exclaimed again. I've arranged for the most active and influential Mortis to come here tomorrow night for a secret conclave. A historic summit of the most evil. Over fifty of the key Mortis will be here, representing their various enclaves, and together we will negotiate and sign a charter, an agreement, for our combined efforts to destroy the Magnus clan once and for all. I couldn't help but smirk. So, leaving the Mortis the dominant vampire clan, and you as its chief, not a very good outcome for the human race. Kim gave a sadistic smile. Oh, Jack, your kind hasn't seen anything yet, I'm afraid. Once we come out into the open, so to speak, we will be free to feast on your kind as never before. It will be the beginning of a new era, Jack. Think of it. The Mortis, under my leadership, now highly organized and learned, will move from the sewers and caves to replace the Magnus in normal human society. Living openly amongst you, with affluence and power, feeding on you as a wolf amidst the sheep. It will truly be the dawn of a new age. Then, Kim leaned closer, and his brown eyes began shining with a serpent-like, reddish glow. Such a pity you won't live to see it, though, Jack. I have big plans for you. Tomorrow night, when all the Mortis delegates have assembled, you will serve as my offering to initiate what I will call the New Vampire World Order. Your blood, Jack will serve to initiate this new dawn of vampire rule over the human race. You should be greatly honored, Jack. From vampire slayer to vampire sacrifice. Poetic justice, isn't it? Kim threw his head back and gave a sadistic laugh. You had help, though, didn't you? I asked. You knew my team was coming to town to look for you. Then you knew exactly when we were coming to hit your house. You had a heads up the whole time. The Magnus knows there's a mole in their clan. They're looking for him. So, who is it, Kim? You might as well tell me before I die. I spat. Kim smiled. Oh, yes, Jack. The mole. First of all, don't you think the term mole sounds so tawdry? I prefer the term informant. And yes, my informant is really the piece de resistance to my whole plan. My magnum opus. My masterpiece. And you'll really appreciate it, Jack. Kim cackled that sadistic laugh again. You really will. Kim then snapped his fingers. From behind me, out walked a little girl. She walked stiffly, mechanically, over to where Kim sat. She was young maybe eight, 
and wore a pretty flowered dress. From behind, I couldn't see her face, especially since it was mostly covered with long brown hair that looked clean and freshly brushed. She went over to Kim, and then he picked her up, placing her on his lap. Her hair still obscured most of her face, but she didn't seem to be afraid of Kim. She was either drugged or under Kim's hypnotic spell. I saw Kim put his hand on her bare thigh. Leave the girl alone, you fucking monster! I hissed. Oh, Jack. Kim purred. I wouldn't dream of deflowering this delicious child. At least not yet. His hand slid even higher on the girl's leg, starting to get under her skirt. You prick! I yelled, now struggling in the chair with all my might, trying to loosen the restraints. But the chair was somehow bolted to the floor, and the restraints were thick leather, impossible to escape from. No worries, Jack, Kim said, as he brushed the girl's hair away from her face. She's not scared. She's actually glad to be back with me. I could see her face then, and I felt I had been punched in the gut. No, more like a knife had been thrust into my heart. It couldn't be, I thought. It's not possible. Yes, said Kim. You were quite rude in snatching her. Nobody likes a thief, Jack. I stared at the girl, still not quite comprehending. It was the girl Roxy and I rescued from Kim's house of horrors just hours ago. Roxy took her to the hospital. I saw her drive away with the girl. So, why? How? I think he's finally figured it out, sir. Came a voice behind me. Roxy walked into the room and stood beside Kim. Together, they both smiled at me in what was clearly their moment of triumph. You. You. I stammered. You're the mole? The look on your face is priceless, Jack, said Roxy. I know it's a shock, but that's the point, isn't it? A mole needs to be someone least suspected, and doing what moles do best, tunneling deep into the organization. I've been feeding Mr. Kim information on Magnus' plans and intentions for months now. It's been especially advantageous being close to Simon, since he was tasked by the elders to be in overall charge of what they call their Mortis Eradication Program. I didn't have access to activities specific to Jack Walker because they were kept especially compartmentalized by the Magnus leadership, but a few weeks ago, Simon provided me that access too. He's such a fool. It was through him that I learned your latest mission was to come to Atlanta to eliminate Mr. Kim. I, of course, informed him of that fact right away. Roxy crossed her arms and gave a chuckle. You were doomed from the start, Jack. Wait, I don't get it, I said. When we breached Kim's house, you killed his bodyguards. I saw it myself. Why would you do that if you were working for Kim? I asked incredulously. It was our deal, interjected Kim. For Roxy to betray the Magnus, she asked to be my chief of security. And not just in charge of my personal security. She is going to oversee the implementation of a future ring of informants that will report on all the activities of the Magnus clan. They'll be decimated soon, of course, but we'll make sure we always know what they're up to. I gave a laugh. That's a good one. A vampire police state. Yes, Jack, replied Roxy. You could say that. As Mr. Kim's power and domination continues to grow, we need to be ruthless in identifying and weeding out any opposition to the establishment of his vision of a new Mortis dynasty. Those not demonstrating the required loyalty will be liquidated. My god, I whispered. You're as crazy as he is. Without fanfare, 
Roxy stepped over and punched me in the face. Hard. Then, for good measure, she belted me once again. This time, I saw stars. That's enough, Roxy. I could hear Kim say. We don't want to have Mr. Walker too bruised up before the convocation tomorrow. You bitch, I said, as I felt blood trickling down my face. You're doing this just for power, to be in charge of some kind of vampire Gestapo, to help protect a monster that rapes, tortures, and kills women, women like you, and does the same to little girls. No, Jack, of course there's more to it. I'm a familiar, remember? Only now, Mr. Kim is my master. I have drunk his blood in the ancient ritual. As such, he will later make me like him. Immortal. Able to live forever. Only now, not as a Magnus vampire. Weak, with useless compassion for humankind, but rather as a Mortis vampire. Strong, with the creed of taking what we want and killing whoever we want. At that moment, I realized Roxy was just as evil as Kim. Two peas in a pod. Why hadn't Simon ever seen this side of her before? Simon will track you down. I nearly yelled. He has a link with you, and Steve and Tom are probably out looking for me right now. Sorry, Jack, Roxy replied. As soon as I drank Mr. Kim's blood, the link with Simon was severed. He knows by now that I've defected, but he'll never find me. And anyway, within a few days, he and the Magnus Elders will be eliminated. As far as Steve and Tom, before I left, I suggested they go search Kim's mansion to look for you. They'll be on a wild goose chase for hours. By morning, they'll be fearing the worst for you. But believe me, Jack, they'll have no way of knowing where you are now. I just need you to sit tight, so to speak, until all of Mr. Kim's guests arrive tomorrow night. How could I have been so wrong about you? I asked, really to no one in particular. Oh, Jack, don't take it so personally, Roxy smiled. She reached down and grabbed my crotch. I do find you attractive, and I wasn't lying about needing a man. Under different circumstances, we could have made a good team, but Mr. Kim sees no way out for you. I'm sorry, but here, just for old times. She quickly dipped her head down and gave me a hard, heavy kiss. I recoiled and then attempted to grab her lips in my teeth. She pulled away in time, laughing. See you tomorrow night, Jack, she said, and then left the room. Kim was getting up too, with the little girl in hand. She's quite the lady, huh, Jack? Well, I have to take off as well. It'll be sunrise in a few hours, and I have things to do. Like reading a bedtime story to this little one. You bastard! I yelled after Kim as he walked out. If you hurt that girl, I'm gonna fucking kill you. I don't care what it takes. I'm gonna kill you, Kim. Do you hear me? Leave her alone. I yelled for minutes on end, until finally my throat became too sore for me to continue. I sat in the chair, sobbing, slumping down and utterly defeated. I had the rest of the night to sit there and contemplate my fate. I must have at last drifted off to sleep because the next thing I knew, there was sun coming in the window. The fire in the fireplace had died out hours before. My throat was parched, and I badly needed something to drink. I struggled once again against the restraints, but it was pointless. Is this the chair I'm going to die in? I wondered. And the last daylight I'll ever see. I strained to hear any voices or signs of activity in the home but it was all deadly quiet. The only sound that permeated the silence was the ticking of a mantel clock above the fireplace. A few more hours passed. I lost track of time 
and I couldn't see the clock from where I sat. I must have dozed once again. I was eventually pulled out of my grogginess by someone calling my name. It was a female voice, gentle, soft, and strangely comforting. Jack, the voice called. Jack, Jack, wake up, baby. My head slowly lulled up, and I squinted at the figure sitting across from me, in the chair Kim had been in the night before. I had to blink several times to try to clear my blurred vision. There, sitting in the chair, was the most beautiful girl I ever knew, both of the flesh and of the heart. Her long blonde hair cascaded around her tanned face, highlighting her angelic sapphire blue eyes. She was wearing those bookish glasses that I so often made fun of. Bethany, I croaked. Are you really there? I'm here, Jack, I heard her say. I need you to focus, Jack. You have to remain strong for just a bit longer. There are forces at play here, Jack, and you're a big piece of it. It'll be dark soon. You need to be ready. I instinctively tried to reach out to her, struggling against my restraints and making my wrists even more raw. Beth, wh what do I need to do? How can I kill Kim? The whole house is going to be full of mortis vampires in a few hours. Bethany smiled her lovely smile and simply replied, While Satan often masquerades as an angel of light, those evildoers that use deceit may themselves be brought down by it. Tonight, the evil corruptors will face righteous retribution. The goodness in you will allow you to prevail, Jack. Remain strong. Never lose faith. Know that I'm watching over you, always, my love. I watched as Bethany, still smiling, placed her hand over her heart, as a parting signal of love, and then slowly began to fade in front of my eyes. Bethany, no, please don't go, Beth, don't go. I cried. In a few moments, I was staring at an empty chair, a tear slid down my cheek. Had I been hallucinating, I wondered. No, I thought, angrily. I wasn't. It really was Bethany. She came to kick me in the ass, and rightfully so. I had given up, sitting here, wallowing in perceived defeat. She wanted me to know something big is coming down, and I've got to be ready to play my part. I needed to be ready. I sat in silence for the rest of the day, save for the never-ending tick of the mantel clock. It seemed to mock me, ticking the hours, minutes, and seconds away to whatever was going to happen as soon as the sun went down. I thought about Steve and Tom and wondered what they were doing at that moment. They were no doubt frantic, since I was missing now for almost twenty-four hours. They probably were fearing the worst, especially since they had to know by now that Roxy was a traitor. Despite everything, I had to inwardly smile. Simon must be fucking livid with anger. Not only was he duped for months by his own familiar, he ended up sending Roxy to Atlanta to help us destroy the very man she was the informant for. Roxy had played him like a cheap fiddle. If it was true, the psychic connection between the two of them had been broken when she swore allegiance to Kim and drank his blood, then Simon must be as helpless to find me as Steve and Tom were. Things didn't look good, but I had to remain optimistic. At any rate, I wasn't going to go down easy, no matter what their plan was for me. I might not be able to stop Kim's initiation of his new Mortis dynasty, but I'd be damned if I were going to let him make me a showpiece with his planned sacrifice. If worse comes to worse, I'll try to kill myself before it comes to that. 
My immediate concern, however, was that, after sitting in this damn chair for a full day, I had to piss like a racehorse. If I didn't get some relief soon, I was literally going to rain on Kim's parade. About an hour later, I could see the daylight beginning to wane through the window. Gonna be showtime soon, I thought. Suddenly, I heard footsteps enter the room behind me. I braced myself for whatever was going to happen next. A big, burly son of a bitch walked over to face me. It was Martin, Roxy's chauffeur, or whatever the fuck he was. It was the first time I had a close look at the guy. He was massive, with biceps straining his suit, and he must have been nearly seven foot tall. With his chiseled features, he reminded me of the actor Ted Cassidy when he played the android Ruck in one of those original Star Trek episodes. I could only assume he wasn't here to be my friend. That thought was rudely confirmed when he smiled and punched me right in the face. Hard enough I was momentarily stunned. He then reached down to undo my restraints. Apparently, the punch was a warning not to resist. He needn't have worried. Once I was untied, Martin grabbed me by the shoulder and hoisted me to my feet. I wobbled for a few seconds and then managed to stand up. He then gave me a shovel and pointed to the door of the room. I started walking, and with Martin close behind, entered a hallway. I passed two closed doors when Martin grabbed me by the shoulder and pointed to the third. The door was already open, and I could see it was a bathroom. He shoved me in, and then stood, watching. I didn't need any urging. I quickly moved to the toilet and peed like a racehorse. While I was grateful for the relief, I couldn't help but wonder why the sudden benevolence on the part of my captors. Well, I didn't complain. Any longer tied to that chair, I definitely would have lost some of my dignity. When I was done, I sighed in relief, zipped up, and turned around. Martin was still standing at the door, and now he pointed over across the room to the shower. There, hanging on a rack, was a set of clothes. Pants, shirts, and a robe, or some kind of cassock with a hood. They were all black. Beneath the clothes, on the floor, was a pair of dress black shoes. I looked back at Martin. He gave me a menacing smile and nodded his head towards the clothes. He wanted me to put them on, I realized. I didn't like what the clothes symbolized. They definitely didn't want me to dress up for a Christian baptism, I thought. But there appeared to be no choice in the matter, not with that brute standing there ready to rip me apart. So I stripped and put on the clothes and cassock. To no surprise, they were a perfect fit, including the shoes. Whatever ceremony Kim had in mind, he had planned it in great detail. I realized then that he wanted his sacrificial lamb dressed for the part. When I was finished tying the shoes, Martin pushed me back into the hallway, but then indicated for me to go left. At least I'm not going back to the chair, I thought. I walked down the hallway and we came to a very large room. Looked to be some kind of parlor or entertainment room. I walked past a pool table, a roulette table, and what looked like a blackjack or a poker table. I'm no expert. Martin pushed me through the room until I came to a door. I opened it and saw a flight of stairs leading up. He pushed me again and I started the climb. When I got to the top... I entered what had to be the top floor of the house. I knew that because as I opened the door, I found myself in a huge circular room surrounded on all 360 degrees by glass windows, with the ceiling one huge circular skylight. It was as if I had entered a circular tower to the house that was surrounded in glass. In the daylight, it must have offered a breathtaking view of the surrounding area, whatever that was. It was dark now, and I couldn't see out. Because of its circular shape, the room reminded me of some kind of amphitheater, those typified by Greek and Roman architecture designed for the enjoyment of dramatic sporting events. 
What really confirmed the room's role were the tiers of seats or bleachers lining the surrounding walls, and the fact the seats were not empty. I suppose if they were full of happy and smiling fans wearing Atlanta Braves baseball caps, it wouldn't have been too alarming, but what I faced was something right out of hell. As soon as I entered, the room erupted into a horrendous litany of jeers, shouts, and curses. The room vibrated with the yells of, Killer! Human scum! Rip his heart out! And, Suck him dry! The cacophony of vile catcalls was unnerving enough. But what was worse was the visage of the repulsive spectators filling the stands. Most of the vampires were transformed, sitting there in their true forms, bulbous and furry bodies, bat-like snouts, displaying rows and rows of sharp teeth, with veiny wings flapping in agitation as they spat their vile curses. A few were in human form only now beginning their inhuman process of transformation. They nevertheless displayed their incisors, dripping spittle in anticipation of what was to come. Their strident screeching amplified as I was marched towards the center of the theater. I looked around and counted nearly a hundred of those ruckus vampire spectators. The creme of the creme of the Mortis vampires from across the country, here to usher in Kim's new vampire world order. Martin pushed me into the center of the room, towards a table on top of a raised pedestal. I could see it had straps hanging down on the sides, but the restraints were not what made me stop in my tracks. No, it was the drain hole in the bottom of the table and the rubber tubing that extended down to some form of reservoir to capture my blood. I knew that as soon as I was tied down to that altar, I would never leave it alive. It was now or never. I punched the fucker in the gut as hard as I could and then ran towards the window. I was going to jump through the glass and most probably die after falling several stories to the ground, but all I cared about was that I would at least spoil Kim's grand ceremonial plans. Unfortunately, before I had run more than ten feet, I felt Martin grab my hair to yank me back. The pain was excruciating. He gave me a withering look as he picked me up, threw me on the table, and quickly fastened the restraints. By that point, I was screaming and hurling curses of my own, in tandem to those cascading down from the gallery. As Martin stepped back from the table, I spat at him. I'll kill you, you bastard. This time, he didn't hit me, but simply gave me what looked almost like a sympathetic look. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but before I could give it further thought, the room suddenly went quiet. Literally. It went from almost an unbearable crescendo of shouts to complete silence where one could hear a pin drop. I looked around and then could see why. Kim Song-ho, the vaunted, self-proclaimed emperor of the new Mortis dynasty, had made his grand entrance. He was dressed similarly to me in a black cassock. Only this one had a red hourglass on the front, similar to the one seen on a Black Widow spider. Also entering the room, trailing at a respectable distance behind him, was that traitorous bitch Roxy, dressed the same. She looked smug, ready to assist her new master in whatever decadent task he may give her. At that moment, I hated her more than I thought I could ever hate anyone. When Kim reached the center of the stage, he stood behind the table where I was laying. He looked down at me and smiled. His mouth was filled with rows of hideous, needle-like teeth. But as I watched, his incisors slid down, curled like a viper's, and as wickedly sharp as an obsidian knife. The bastard gave me a wink, and then he held out his arms. He looked out into the audience and proclaimed, 
Members of the Mortis clan, welcome. Tonight we will usher in a new dawn for our people. A new vampire world order where we will come together as one cohesive and organized community to rule over humankind as the dominant vampire clan. Tonight, your existence will be changed forever. The room once again broke out into a tremendous cacophony of noise, although this time it consisted of applause and shouts of Kim, Kim, Kim. The megalomaniac vampire clearly enjoyed the adulation as he folded his arms across his chest and jutted out his chin, reminding me of the old wartime movie tone film clips of Benito Mussolini. On the balcony of the Palazzo Venezia, mugging for the crowds down below in the piazza. After a minute of that frenzied adulation, Kim once again put up his arms and the crowd quieted. Tonight, we will set forth a new path for our people, Kim continued. By signing a charter of unity and cooperation of the Mortis Vampire Clan, or what I call simply the Charter of Unity, this document will serve as our agreement to unite as one entity, and to cooperate towards our ultimate goal, the final destruction of the Magnus Vampire Clan. Another thunderous applause shook the room. We will defeat the Magnus Clan in the coming weeks, I heard Kim boast. We will begin planning for our offensive immediately. We tried once before, decades ago with what the Magnus Elders call the Blood Purge. It failed, because we did not have the unity, the organization, and the numbers. This time, we will be ruthless in our eradication of the Magnus. When they are gone, we will be free to prey upon humankind without reprisals or retribution. After another minute of prolonged applause, Kim then pointed down to me. Who were the Magnus to judge us, to try to destroy us, to enlist human volunteers to hunt us down? Murderers like this man here. Over the past year, Jack Walker has killed hundreds of our kind. Without blinking an eye, he reveled in it. His first kill was our beloved Alexandria, the greatest vampire queen the Mortis clan has ever known. He deserves to be punished for his crimes, and so he shall be. Tonight, I offer him to you as a sacrifice to usher in our new vampire world order. You will each drink a share of his blood, and the rest will be used as ink as you sign your names on the Charter of Unity. This will be the most fitting, don't you agree? The theater erupted into thunderous applause and frenzied shouts of adulation for Kim. I felt sick to my stomach, knowing that my blood was going to serve as ink to codify their monstrous new agenda. If Kim and his Mortis legions succeeded in decimating the Magnus and assuming hegemony over the vampires, the human race as I knew it was essentially doomed. Then Kim dropped his worst surprise yet. His voice rose in mocking triumph as he continued. Yes, Jack Walker will pay for his sins. I could kill him myself, but I have a special treat for you all. As many of you know, my new familiar, Roxanne, betrayed her Magnus Master, who himself was, ironically, in charge of our extermination. She made it possible for us to capture Mr. Walker. She has now sworn her allegiance to the Mortis Clan, and someday... She will be rewarded with her own immortality. She is tough and ruthless, and I have put her in charge of our imminent attack against the Magnus Elders. How perfect to have her render the killing blow to Jack Walker. Not only one human killing another human, ushering in the new age of the Mortis Vampyr, but also the final humiliation of the Magnus clan. The room erupted into one final crescendo of applause, which seemed to last forever. I had had enough. 
You're one fucking pompous windbag, Kim. I shouted. Are you just trying to bore me to death, or are you really going to do something? For a moment, after my outburst, Kim glared at me and hissed, flashing me his gaping maw with row upon row of sharp, quill-like teeth. As quickly as it had come, the anger subsided, and Kim resumed his cocky composure. Oh, Jack, always the smart mouth to the very end. Well, before you die, I want you to know that Roxanne also was privy to where you had Simon relocate your mother and sister for safekeeping a year ago. When this is done, Jack, I'm personally going to go there and turn your mother. Your little sister, too, once I have my way with her. There's nothing like the young flesh, you know. You prick, I yelled as I twisted and strained with all my might against the table's restraints. Don't you dare touch them. I'll kill you, you bastard. Kim just smiled wider and cackled. Jack, in another minute you won't be able to worry about it. He looked up to the audience and bellowed. Behold, Jack Walker. The great, feared vampire slayer. The crowd once again chanted his name as if he was some sort of god and savior. He had clearly achieved his goal of being recognized as the emperor of the Mortis clan of vampires with my complete humiliation and degradation. As I struggled to no avail, I could only watch hopelessly as Kim beckoned Roxy to come forward. From a nearby table, Kim picked up a wickedly-looking knife, curved and very sharp, closely resembling those carried by the Gurkha soldiers in the British Army. He handed the knife to Roxy, who bowed and accepted it with complete reverence. My child, Kim proclaimed to Roxy, it is your honor to usher in our dynasty that will last a hundred millennia. I'm honored. My master, Roxy replied. She then turned towards me and stepped forward so that she was now in front of Kim. Roxy looked down at me. I stared into her eyes. What did I see there? They were as cold as ice, completely devoid of emotion. Jack Walker, she encountered in Latin. Seek transit gloria mundi, soltes qui facit. I had no idea what it meant, but I glared at her defiantly and yelled, Just do it, and fuck you, Roxy. The vampires in the stands were now shouting in near ecstasy as they anticipated Roxy's downward thrust of the knife against my throat. At the moment the cries of the undead reached its pinnacle, Roxy suddenly smiled and gave me a wink. I saw her push the mortise knife into her waistband. Almost simultaneously, she pulled out a long, straight knife with an ivory handle that looked strangely familiar. Even when I saw the Latin inscription Deus Lux Mea Est on the blade, I didn't register what I was seeing. In the blink of an eye, she whirled upon Kim and plunged the blade deep into his chest. What happened next is hard to describe. All hell broke loose. In a split second, my mind registered so many things taking place. First, there was Kim's face, framed in first total surprise, and then agonizing pain as the blade punctured his heart. I saw Roxy falling with him to the floor, where I lost sight of them. Then, immediately... Every window in the circular room shattered inwards. A massive swarm of bats entered the room, crashing through the windows and massing on the mortis vampires in the stand. Screams of surprise, anger, and pain suddenly permeated the room. Furry, winged bodies were flying every which way. The room was a complete blur. It was total chaos. The next thing I knew, someone was leaning over the table. It was Steve. I couldn't even say his name. 
I was frozen in shock trying to take in the whole scene. Jack! Steve shouted into my ear as he fumbled with restraints. Thank God you're still alive. Let me get you untied. Steve worked the restraints and then pulled me off the altar. I slid down to the floor and he and I ended up sitting against the side of the altar, where we had a front row view of the ongoing carnage taking place throughout the room. It's the Magnus Vampire Clan, Steve explained, shouting over the sound of the fighting. They knew about the meeting tonight. It's the ultimate showdown. I looked around. The small bats had now grown to their full size, now identical with the large, furry, half-bat, half-human bodies of the Mortis vampires. I could see opposing pairs of vampires wrestling in the stands and on the floor. They were snapping at each other's throats with their horrible incisors. Some of the Mortis were running for the exit, but were quickly overtaken and subdued by the Magnus army. "'Stay here,' said Steve, as he thrust a water cannon filled with holy water into my arms. "'If any of the Mortis come at you, give them a drenching. Tom here's somewhere, too. I'm going to join the fight.' My mind was still reeling as I watched Steve run into the throng. Before I lost sight of him... I saw him shoot a stream of water at one of the mortis trying to climb out one of the shattered windows. The bat-like creature screamed in pain and fell back to the floor. As I collected my thoughts, I suddenly remembered Kim and Roxy. I slid around the side of the altar and cautiously looked around the corner. There, on the floor, I saw Roxy. She was on top of Kim, straddling him and slowly and methodically sawing off the vampire's head. Still connected by a few tendons, Kim's head lulled to the sides to face me. Black ichor was pouring out of his mouth. His eyes were wide open, still registering shock and dismay. The fucking megalomaniac probably didn't even have time to comprehend how his dream of glory and conquest could be so quickly snatched away, I thought and by his own familiar, his faithful Roxanne. I didn't understand how she pulled it off, but I figured there would be time for explanations later. For now, I need to get into the fight as well. There was no way any of these Mortis delegates could be allowed to escape. I ran into the horde of fighting vampires. Fortunately, I found it fairly easy to distinguish between the Magnus and Mortis vampires, even in their bat-like forms. Most obvious was that the Magnus clan tended to have light brown fur and lighter in texture, as opposed to the black, thicker fur of the Mortis. A second feature was that the Mortis's elongated bat ears were longer and more pointier than those of the Magnus. I quickly came across one of the Mortis who was trying to strangle one of the invading Magnus, and I shot him in the face with the holy water. He quickly toppled off and began writhing on the floor. I kept moving amidst the warring factions and assisting where I could. A minute later, I spotted Tom in the crowd. He looked like a fatter, out-of-shape version of that Sylvester Stallone character, John Rambo, in that new movie that just came out earlier in the year. What was it called? Oh yeah, First Blood. The similarity with Rambo was that Tom was holding not one, but two water cannons at waist level, laying waste to hapless mortis with bursts of ten-foot streams of holy water and overlapping fields of fire. Strapped on Tom's back were extra cylinders of water, and on his vest were tied several water grenades. Tom was completely in his element, and judging from that smile on his face, he was having the time of his life. When he turned and saw me, he ran on over. If my arms were free, I'd give you a bear hug, kid, he said. Damn, it's great to see you in one piece. Simon's here, somewhere. He'll explain later. But here, take one of these. I'm making the rounds, passing them out to all the Magnus, so they can finish these mortis pricks off. With that, Tom opened a canvas bag slung across his chest. I could see it was full of knives with ivory handles, 
all with bright blades and the inscription Deus Lux Mea Est, all identical to Bethany's vampire-killing knife, and the one I saw Roxy use to dispatch the late Mr. Kim Song Ho. I reached into the bag and took one of the knives. Be careful, Tom, I said, before he turned and ran back into the fray. I took a few steps and then slipped and fell. I realized that the floor was now a near river of black ichor mixed with holy water. More vampire blood than water. The room had basically become a charnel house, filling up with blood, gore, and bodies. I got up, and at that moment I saw one of the mortis making a run at me. His bat wings were wide open and ready to wrap me in a lethal embrace. I barely had time to get the water cannon up and fire in time. I hit the vampire square in the chest, and the impact created a sizzling, gaping wound. He dropped to the floor, body smoking and flopping around like he received ten thousand volts. I bent down over him as he transformed back to human form. He looked to be much younger than me, perhaps only fifteen or sixteen. Please, he whispered. I haven't done anything. I'm not like the rest. I just want to go home. Please, let me go. His protestations caught me off guard, as well as the fact he looked so young. For a moment, I hesitated. But just for a moment. I remembered that the kid beneath me was likely hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And as such had killed countless numbers of innocent humans. I plunged my knife deep into his chest, and I twisted it several times for good measure. A mass of sanguine tar began to pour out from the creature's nose, eyes, and mouth. Another mortis ran near me, and I blasted it with the cannon, hitting it in the legs. It toppled over. I would deal with it later. I turned back to the task at hand and began taking off the boy's head, keeping a wary eye all around me. The place was still in utter chaos, with individual skirmishes all around me, and the wails of pain and death were almost deafening. After leaving the boy, I turned to the vampire that I had shot in the legs. This vampire, too, had transformed. This one was a female, but older, maybe in her forties. She had a retro poodle hairstyle, and with her fiery red hair, she looked a lot like my favorite comedian, Lucille Ball. I took in her ruined legs, which were still sizzling and smoking. The great Jack Walker. The vampire's voice caused my eyes to quickly dart to her face. The great vampire slayer. She hissed. How ironic, I shall be brought down by the man we had only heard whispered stories about, that everyone feared would come to us when we least expected it. You are our boogeyman, our grim reaper. Her eyes stared straight into mine. Strangely, I did not see hate in those eyes. Perhaps just acceptance, perhaps almost relief. Just do it, she said. Do it now. And so I obliged her, plunging the knife into her heart. Minutes later, as I was removing Lucy's head, I saw a large shape out of the corner of my eye, closing fast. I quickly glanced up, and to my horror, I saw Martin bearing down on me. The guy looked even more frightening than usual. His shirt was in shreds, and he was covered almost from head to toe in vampire gore. His eyes were locked on to mine. Oh shit, I thought. He's going to tear me limb from limb. And I had nothing to defend myself with except the knife, which seemed too small and puny when faced with the huge behemoth heading my way. Before he got within arm's reach, I thrust out the knife. Martin stopped in his tracks. Then, to my surprise, he gave me the saddest look, like a guilty child trying to apologize for some wrongdoing. 
He just shook his head back and forth as if he were indicating no. I suddenly realized I had never heard him speak. I wasn't sure what he was trying to indicate, but then I noticed he had something in his hand. I looked up and saw my SIG P220. After a slight moment of fear, thinking he was going to shoot me, he twisted the pistol around and handed it to me butt first. It was only then that I realized that he must have been in on the ruse against Kim along with Roxy. Martin wasn't one of the bad guys. He was on our team. I took the gun and said, I... thanks, Martin. He gave a childlike smile, turned away, and then disappeared back into the warring crowd. Several minutes later, after taking care of Lucy and two others I fell with the water cannon, I stood up. Without warning, I suddenly felt like I was hit with a heavy sledgehammer in my back. Next came a sharp wave of searing pain in my shoulder. The force of the assault caused me to fall flat on my face, and I saw stars as my forehead hit the floor. I heard my sig go sliding across the floor, no longer in reach. I managed to twist around, now lying on my back, and could see Kim's familiar, the secretary, Lee, standing above me with a huge hunting knife in her hand. Although she was human, the boiling hate within her had twisted her once pretty face into a hideous rictus. She let out an unmistakable chortle of sheer psychotic derangement as she began to lunge at me again. She surely would have gotten in another blow with the knife, but suddenly her head exploded in a red halo. She was dead before she hit the floor. I looked up and saw Roxy holding her Smith & Wesson Model 59, smoke still rising from its muzzle. I should have killed that fucking bitch the first time I saw her. She cursed. Roxy then knelt down to my side, gently placing one hand under my head to raise it up off the floor, her other grasping my hand. Jack, are you okay? She asked, with a great look of concern. Let me look at that shoulder. With her help, I managed to sit up. Roxy probed the wound in my back. Ah! I couldn't help but wince with the pain as she took a look. You're lucky, Roxy said. She stabbed you right in the shoulder blade and it hit the bone. Could have been worse. She could have hit the lung. Roxy took in my face next. When you fell, you did a number on your forehead, too, she assessed. Yeah, I replied, but not as bad as when you belted me in the face yesterday. You got a lot of explaining to do. I grumbled. Roxy squeezed my hand and gave me a sheepish smile. I know. It's complicated. It was all Simon's plan. I'm so sorry. You probably hate me. I get it, I replied. You got Kim. I don't know how you all pulled it off, but that's the important thing. Well, we still got work to do here, Roxy pointed out. We need to make sure every single Mortis representative to this shindig is dead. We need to end this now. Come on. She helped raise me to my feet. As we looked around, we could see the battle was beginning to wane. There were still several individual skirmishes going on, but the numbers of headless mortis vampires clearly showed the battle was nearing its end, and with the Magnus looking victorious. Far across the room, I could see Steve and Tom working together to finish off a female mortis. Covered in tattoos and wearing black leather, she looked like a member of the Hell's Angels. Jack. I heard a familiar voice call out. I turned around, and there was Simon. He had transformed back to his human form. And, as usual, he was dressed in his usual professional attire. This time he wore a buttoned-down cardigan sweater. The only thing that showed the reality of the moment was that he was smeared nearly head to toe in black ichor and God knows what else. Nevertheless, he came up to me and gave me a huge bear hug. Uh, good to see you too, Simon. I managed to squeak out, barely able to breathe. You're forgetting your vampire strength. 
Simon released me and smiled. Sorry, Jack. I got carried away. Just so happy to see you. But look, I know you went through hell. I'll explain everything as soon as it's over. Never mind that, I quickly told Simon. Just please tell me Kim was lying when he said he knew where my mother and sister are. Don't worry, Jack, replied Simon. He wasn't lying. He really thought he knew where they had been relocated. But Roxy had fed him bogus information. They're completely safe. Thank God, I thought. That was one of my deals with Simon a year ago. That my family had to be protected at all costs. Kim's threat of paying them a visit had chilled me to my very core. An hour later, the room was nearly quiet, except for a low murmur of conversation. The victorious Magnus vampires were now seated in the same bleachers that were occupied by the now dead Mortis just an hour before. They had reverted to their human forms. There looked to be nearly two hundred of them. There were men and women, outwardly looking to be of all ages, and I was surprised to spot a few children as well. Apparently, the Magnus clan had taken no chances, having massed a truly formidable offensive army of which to defeat the Mortis vampires, and since the existence of the human race was at stake, I was grateful for that. They had won, and at their feet lay nearly a hundred remains of Mortis, Steve, Tom, Roxy, and I sat together, waiting for Simon to address everyone. Roxy had insisted on cleaning and dressing my knife wound, and I could see the concern in her eyes. I like this caring version of Roxy better than Kim's evil Roxanne, I said to her. She smiled as I leaned over, brushing her lips to my ear. I told you I'd always have your back, and I meant it. A few moments later, Simon walked out to the center of the room and looked up at everyone. My fellow Magnus, I stand before you with the deepest gratitude and respect. Because of you, our clan will survive. And because we survive, the human race will survive. The room broke into a rapturous applause. When our Council of Elders declared the emergency, you all stepped forward. You came from all walks of life in the human world, but you were all united by the threat to our collective existence. By coming here, you proved once again that what sets us apart from the Mortis is our cohesiveness and our sense of community. The Magnus clan affirmed millennia ago that we could, and would, coexist with humans and live amongst them in peace. To do that means we also have to protect them. The Mortis, if completely unleashed and uninhibited, and in all their evil manifestations, would certainly have decimated the human race within a decade. The battle you wage today has saved the world, and will be recorded as one of the greatest epics in the annals of vampire history. We all erupted into cheers and applause, and although it may sound hokey, we all hugged and congratulated each other. After all, it's not that often you're told you just saved the world. Simon continued. Now, I know that prior to today, many of you have heard of Jack Walker and his colleagues Steve and Tom, and that they are only a handful of humans in countless centuries who have been privy to our existence, having been given the remits by our Council of Elders to hunt down and kill the Mortis during the time we cannot walk around in the daylight. Some in this room even knew Bethany, our long-term Mortis hunter who helped to find Jack. Well, on this auspicious day... I want to recognize Jack for playing a key role in the downfall of Kim Sung-ho and his evil minions. And also, Simon held up his hands to hold off the thunderous applause that had started. I was a bit taken back by the amount of praise that seems to be coming from all the Magnus vampires. Also, Simon was finally able to continue. My familiar, Roxy who rendered herself a willing pawn in the trap we set for Kim. She gave her consciousness over so that I could control her actions. 
Kim trusted her, and that was his downfall. I'm sure the knife being plunged into his heart brought total astonishment, as it was the last thing he ever expected. Simon turned to the four of us and indicated we should rise. As we did, Simon announced, Please, everyone, I give you our partners, our friends, now and forever. Steve, Tom, Roxy, and I stood up for a tremendous adulation. I felt a bit embarrassed as the vampires in the room did the real work. Steve, though, I noticed, got off on it and took several bows to the crowd. When he saw my look, he leaned over and said, I know, bro, but in how many millennia are we going to get this kind of recognition? I smiled. I certainly didn't want to mitigate Steve's fifteen minutes of fame. So I, too, waved back to the Magnus vampires to acknowledge their praise, enjoying my own moment. The rest of the night was truly one of a kind. We mingled with the Magnus vampires, and even though I had been fighting on behalf of them for a year, I admit I really never knew them as individuals, well, other than Bethany. That night, in my conversations with so many of them, I learned that they were the same as me, hoping for a better life and to live in peace and prosperity. I spoke with one vampire, her name was Althea. While now living as a housewife in Chicago, she revealed that she worked with Bethany over a hundred years ago. She recounted how she and Bethany arrived at the Hinterkaufic farm in 1922 and discovered they had just missed Alexandria. Together, they had also tracked down Alexandria through France, the United Kingdom, and then to the States, where they had lost her trail. Althea told me other personal stories of working with Bethany for decades— Stories of Beth's warmth, love, and generosity that lifted me up and served to reinforce my decision to dedicate my life to tracking down the mortars. Two hours before dawn, we knew it was time to say goodbye. I watched as Tom apologized to one young man for earlier accidentally spraying his arm with holy water while he was aiming for a nearby mortis during the battle. The vampire's arm was already healing, and I heard him tell Tom, Don't worry, man. You did great today. I'd work with you any time. A few more farewells later, Simon, Steve, Tom, Roxy, and I were left alone in the theater as we watched the squeaking cauldron of bats fly through the shattered windows and out into the night. As if on cue, Martin walked out of nowhere and stood next to Roxy. Simon turned to me and said, Jack, before I go, I know I owe you some more answers. I didn't want to go into too much detail until we were all alone. Here's the whole story. As I told you before, the Magnus elders had for years tried to infiltrate the Mortis with our own people, but the program was largely unsuccessful. The problem was that it was just too hard for our kind to pass themselves off as Mortis. We don't possess the same characteristics, namely, we are not evil. Sooner or later, we would always be found out, and developing informants from within their own ranks was just as useless. Then, last year, I had an idea. Why not dangle someone from our side that could be seen as an informant for them? That they would trust, thinking they were dealing with a Magnus traitor. A double agent, if you will. Someone that could feed the Mortis with false information on our plans and intentions, and at that same time feed us with what they learn about the Mortis. But not a vampire, no. Someone that they would see as weak, with vulnerabilities. A human. One of our familiars. And the beauty of it was that I believed I could mentally program the familiar to the point where I could wall off that part of the mind that the Magnus would be able to read. In other words, I could submerge our asset's true consciousness deep enough 
that the mortis would never suspect their true intentions, and only know the thoughts of that person that we wanted them to know. Then, about eight months ago, I met Roxy. She was perfect for the role. How could the mortis resist having a spy within our clan that was the familiar of the vampire in charge of hunting them down? And so, she became my familiar. And she had her reasons for wanting this. And yes, someday, if she still wants to, she will become one of us. So anyway, I spent a lot of time with her, becoming able to compartmentalize that part of her mind that was really her, supplanting it to that part that was the evil Roxy. By the time we were ready to dangle her, we next had to figure out the best way to do it. By then, we had a very large file on Kim, recognizing that he was the most dangerous of the Mortis. Not so much for the fact he lived respectfully amongst humans, but because he had made it his personal mission to make the Mortis clan a well-organized and cohesive entity, with the goal of domination of the human race. And with Kim's megalomania, we felt he couldn't resist having the opportunity to have a mole within our clan. So, what we did was dangle Roxy at a cocktail party that Kim threw for the Atlanta business community. Long story short, Roxy pitched him with who she was. She claimed to be disappointed with her meager role as my bodyguard and offered to work for him if he would promise her the power she sought, and to eventually be a vampire like him. It worked. Over the past several months, we had her pass along information about us, much of it true, so that she would gain Kim's confidence. The latest info she passed was that you, Jack, were coming to Atlanta to eliminate him. We knew there was no way he could resist confronting Jack Walker, the great vampire slayer. I gave Simon a look, and he knew what I was going to say. He held up his hands. I know. I was placing you in danger, and I do apologize for that, but we needed to have Roxy pass him a big fish. A big enough fish he might flaunt for his plan to get together of the other Mortis vampires. Yes, that's right. We knew that he was planning the meeting to launch his new Vampire World Order, and to have the delegates sign some kind of charter of unity, but we didn't know when or where. Kim may not have confided this with Roxy unless she had some role to play. And she definitely did. Even we were surprised when he decided to give her the honorific role in killing you, Jack. But talk about the perfect culmination of all our efforts. I gave Simon another look, and lamented. It would have been a culmination, all right, if she managed to plunge that knife down in my heart. I saw the evil in her eyes at that moment and I thought I was done for. Simon looked serious and replied, I played it to the very edge. I know, Jack. I had to let the evil Roxy go as long as I could in case Kim was reading her thoughts. At the last second, I put her back in charge, and before Kim had time to detect any difference, Roxy's knife was in his heart. I took everything Simon said in consideration. Well done. I finally relented. Beautifully done, in fact. I have no hard feelings, all for the common good. I almost lost faith for a while, until Bethany came to see me. Steve and Tom all gave me an incredulous look. Yeah, that's right. When I was tied to that chair all night, believing Roxy had betrayed us, and knowing Kim was close to changing the world forever, I was at my lowest point. I'd given up. But then, Beth came to me. She told me I had an important part to play in what was going to happen, and I needed to focus. She gave me a motivational kick in the ass, just like she always used to do. Steve put his arm on my shoulder and said, Bro, I know you still miss her, but... No, I cut him off. She was sitting there as plain as day. I wasn't imagining it. Steve and Tom both looked unconvinced. Simon cut in and said, No, I don't doubt Jack saw some kind of manifestation of Bethany, 
There are some things about our kinds that even I am not sure of. It's possible Bethany's life force still remains. I don't know how or why. But if she's going to remain around anybody, it's going to be you, Jack. A few minutes later, it was time for Simon to leave. He turned to Roxy and said, Rox, it seems to me you and these guys made a good team. There are still mortars out there to deal with. We broke their back tonight, and they'll be disorganized and fragmented without a leader, but we can never let them regroup. There are still plenty of rogue mortars out there feeding on mankind. You are still my familiar, and you still have my agreement. The elders will accept you into the Magnus Vampire Clan whenever you are ready. With that, Simon morphed, and a second later was gone. We made our way out of the building, and only then did I learn where I had been held the past two days. Kim had a large lodge of sorts, located on a secluded piece of property around Lake Lanya, not far from Duluth. Kim had ordered me to bring you here, Roxy explained. So I gave you the sedative when you came to my room. Martin then drove us here. That's when something occurred to me. My god, Roxy, what about the little girl you were supposed to have taken to the hospital uh, who was back here with Kim yesterday? Please tell me that monster didn't touch her. Roxy smiled. No worries, Jack. He was too busy planning for his epic ceremony. He locked the girl up. And just before all hell broke loose, Martin got her out. She's safe. Her parents are going to have a Christmas gift they'll never forget. A half hour later, we were back to our motel. It seemed like years since I had left. We were all tired, filthy, and worn out. So we went to our separate rooms to clean up and get some well-deserved sleep. I was woken up by a knock on my door. I got up and quickly threw on sweatpants and a t-shirt. I could see it was nearly three in the afternoon. I had slept for nearly six hours. I looked through the peephole and saw it was Roxy. I opened the door. She was dressed similar to the first time I saw her. Cargo pants and sports jacket over a t-shirt. Going somewhere? I asked as I stepped away from the door. She came inside and said, I know what Simon told me, that I was free to stay with all of you. And I want that more than anything, not just for the action. Hey, I finally killed an actual vampire, and I think I liked it. She smiled, and so did I. But, but more than anything, I'd love to stay because of you. Everything I told you before was no ruse or some role-playing for Kim. I really like you, Jack. A lot. I've been alone all my life. No real friends, no one I've ever grown to trust. But I feel connected to you. You're a good man, Jack. I really wanted to get to know you better. But I heard what you said about Bethany. I don't think I can compete with a ghost, Jack. So, I think it's best to go back to Simon, to be his bodyguard again. It's what I do best, anyway. I just wanted to... Roxy's voice trailed off as she looked behind me. There, standing in the doorway, was Kim's deputy, An Pyong So. In that split second, I remembered that he was unaccounted for. We had never actually seen him at Kim's house or at the lodge. He was holding a revolver. His crazed eyes and disheveled appearance told me he was completely unhinged. You, he said, looking at Roxy. You killed him. The master thought you'd get away with it, didn't you? It's time for your reckoning. Time to die, bitch. But first, he continued now swiveling the gun towards me. I'm gonna kill Jack Walker, famous vampire hunter, 
You've got so much blood on your hands. I'm going to avenge every mortis you killed. What happens next happened in the blink of an eye, but it seems to move in slow motion. In the split second I could see Ahn was going to pull the trigger, Roxy took a step forward, and then to her left, throwing herself in front of me. I heard a crack as the gun went off, and I felt Roxy tumbling into me. I caught her in my arms, and we both fell to the floor. I flinched when I heard another bang, expecting to feel the impact of a bullet. However, when I looked up, I saw it was Ahn who had been shot, now spinning around to face his attacker. Before he could bring his gun on target, another round tore into his neck. Blood sprayed everywhere as Ahn staggered back a few steps and fell to the floor, adding a new color scheme to the already gaudy cheap motel carpet. Once he was clear from the doorway, I could see Tom holding his Colt 45. Standing next to him was Steve, face a mask of panic. I looked back down at Roxy, still in my arms. I frantically turned her over. Oh my god, I whispered as I saw blood pumping out of the gunshot wound in her chest. She was dying. Two days before Christmas, I was still in Atlanta. Steve and Tom had gone back to Los Angeles. I told them I would see them for Christmas, but I wasn't sure about that. I just didn't feel in a festive mood. When one has saved the world, you'd think they'd be on cloud nine. But I wasn't. As I walked along the city's streets in the early dawn hours, the winter sky was gray, bleak, and overcast. The mercury had taken a dip, and I shivered as my California jacket proved no match for the increasingly cold wind. I came upon my usual stop a small kiosk selling freshly cut flowers. I bought a nice bouquet and continued on. It was the least I could do for Roxy. As I walked the nearly deserted streets, I gave a lot of thought to what had transpired during the past week. Witnessing evil in its most naked form was nothing new to me, but how much longer could I take it? I felt like each time we did a mission, a little piece of me was lost never to be recovered. The only thing that kept me going was that each mission also showed me the positive side of humanity. It reaffirmed my belief in the good in people, of friendship, trust, and loyalty. Thank God for Steve and Tom, my anchors. Roxy was right. It is a lonely life without people you can trust. By late morning, I walked into Gwinnett Medical Center. I knew my way up the ICU quite well by this point. I had been a frequent visitor there for the past three days. When I walked into the ward, Becky, one of the ICU nurses, gave me a smile. She's doing good, Jack. Vital signs are strong, and her body seems to be recovering from the surgery quite well. She hasn't been fully awake yet due to the heavy medication. Maybe today or tomorrow. You're welcome to go in. I told her thanks and went into the room. Although I'd been coming here for days, it was still hard to see Roxy. Once so strong and vibrant, hooked up to all the machines, feeding her medication, nourishment, and monitoring her vital signs. Now she looked so frail and vulnerable. But she was a fighter, and although it was touch and go... She beat the odds. She was still asleep, and I looked down at her. Her long, blonde hair was loose, cascading around her shoulders. She looked pale, causing the old scar next to her eye to stand out even more. I turned around to the table and dumped out yesterday's flowers, replacing them with the fresh bouquet. I opened the blinds a bit to let some of the daylight into the room. As I turned back to the bed... I saw Roxy's eyes open, and she was looking at me. Hi, I said. Hi, she said back. 
You're going to be okay, I told her. Uh Aha, was her reply. That was a foolish thing to do, I said again. But you saved my life. Uh Aha, came her reply again. So, uh, look, I started. I called Simon and told him that you were going to be okay. That one little bullet could never put down a tough cookie like you. I told him I wanted you to stay with us. With me. No, uh, not really. I told him I needed you to stay. A tear slid down the side of Roxy's cheek. But why do you want me to stay? She whispered. I smiled. Because you have my back. I said. I looked down and took her hands into mine. And I'm always going to have yours. <laughs>